Welcome to Sachs Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Hey guys, happy holidays. Welcome to another Tuesday Night Podcast. And I was asking Melissa today, I said, you know, do we keep doing this? Do we keep having our Tuesday night podcast? Do we just go indefinitely? You know, I said, you know, even Seinfeld had a limit on the number of episodes. They, you know, but I figure, you know, we have to at least do this Tuesday night podcast to get us through 2025 because so much is happening, so much is going on. And, you know, um, I know you guys are hearing a lot of mixed messages in the news about the housing market and how everything's really okay and we're going to have a soft landing and uh, and that everything is fine in the housing market, that interest rates are going to drop, that prices are going to continue to go up um, and that sellers are getting what they want. There's so much going on right now. Um, I can tell you that I think a lot of what you're hearing is just uh, you're being pushed out. You know, I think it's uh, a lot of it's agenda based. There's a lot of pressure that is on this election that's coming up. And, you know, all of the associations from uh, the Mortgage Bankers Association to the National Association of Realtors and the National Home Builders Association, um, you know, they all want to obviously continue the uh, strength or at least the narrative of the strength in the housing market, because as we know, it makes up a very large part of uh, the basket of goods in GDP, somewhere around 40 percent. So we need a positive, you know, push on housing and to keep, you know, the economy going. The disconnect is that uh, people are having a hard time paying their bills. And so, you know, you can push this narrative as much as you want. Uh, the bottom line is nobody knows it more than the people that are struggling to make ends meet right now and struggling to pay their bills, struggling to pay their high utility costs and everything else that comes with owning a home. Um, the other thing is, you know, the inventory. And we're, we're going to go over a lot tonight. I'm going to let Melissa here uh uh, tell you who we have on deck. We have uh, five agents that are going to be coming in at different intervals. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing we're going to talk about here tonight is the um, the comparison from 2005 through 2008 as it compares, in my opinion, to how we've seen, well, it's not my opinion, how we've seen it play out the comparisons in 2022 through now. Uh, but really the question is, you know, how will it uh, affect 24 and 25 in the housing market? Because I think you guys are going to really be uh, astonished when we look at some of the data. I pulled a lot of articles up, past articles, had to dig into the archives. And um, so we've got some great uh, articles to bring up. We're also going to address some headlines that are happening. So Fannie Mae, uh, their MBA economists say that um, they're they're still expecting a 24 recession uh, in the actual term of what you know uh, a recession actually means. I know that this past year they've kind of redefined what a recession is, uh, but really um, uh, the big a topic is the amount of inventory that we're seeing come on the market, which is unprecedented for this time of year. I mean, it's it's like crazy. I was just looking in um, doing a search for a customer today in Baltimore County. And just for you know the heck of it, I decided to uh, look up the inventory. And, you know, over the last 10 days, almost 30 percent in Baltimore County of the inventory that is on the market right now has come on the market in the last 10 days, which is, I mean, it's huge. We, you don't see people putting your house on the market a week or two weeks before Christmas. You know, you just don't see it, you know? 
Um, so, and through Hanukkah, I mean, you just don't, you don't see it. So just the fact that, and, and one of the, um, theories that I have, and there are a lot of people that disagree with this theory, but I believe that as we see interest rates come down, which we've seen now mortgage, 30 year mortgage rates get into the sixes that is triggering sellers to put their house on the market because a lot of people that, you know, haven't sold their house or listed their house. And it's not always the ones that want to buy something else either. There's a lot of people that just want to sell, do something else, move in. A lot of people have moved out of their houses and moved in with their kids and their houses are sitting vacant and they haven't put them on the market yet. So there, there's a lot of inventory that has hit the market recently. I'm going to go over some articles on that. Um, so you're not just taking it from me. And um, the other thing we're going to talk about is the DOJ, Department of Justice. There's a lot going on with that as it pertains to the NAR probe um, that was settled. And now... D the DOJ under the Biden administration wants to reopen it. And now an appellate court just heard, you know, uh, argument from NAR and the DOJ on how they should open this case back up, which is really coming in a bad time for the National Association of Realtors. And then we'll kind of go over how 47, um, the new lawsuit, 47 brokerages and associations in Texas have just been served. Uh, there's a lawsuit, a uh, copycat lawsuit going on in Texas right now. Um, so a lot going on in the real estate industry. What does that mean for all of you? Um, we'll try and tie it together because it is going to affect uh, these lawsuits are going to, it's going to trickle down. It is going to have an impact on buyers and sellers. I don't think that people really realize how much yet, uh, but uh, we'll address some of that too. But Melissa, why don't you tell us, mm -hmm. first of all, thank you for another Tuesday night. Joining You're welcome. And thank you. Wonderful podcast. I guess love you. I, they, they comment oh, all the nice. time. It's very kind. No we huge have a laptop lot. Tonight, Dalton. I'm, I'm on the huge laptop. I'm, I'm on it. Oh, so you just yeah, can't. There you go. <laughs> you can't see it because I'm see on it. it but. Yeah, we're just uh, in this setup. It's a temporary setup. We'll be back in the office, fingers crossed, um, back at the studio next week. But yeah, we decided that it would be really cool to pull some of our agents from across the country in. You're going to be hearing from markets in New Mexico, Georgia, Boise, Idaho, Honolulu, Hawaii, which is extremely cool, and Jacksonville, Florida. And that's Phil Simonetta. He's been on our show before. And he's going to come back. But what I found interesting in the conversations I have had recently with these agents is that they are seeing more contracts fall through and then the homes go back on the market and then they're sitting. And they're also seeing in some markets seller financing. And that's becoming more popular, which I found was fascinating as well. So um I can't wait to really dive in to hear what these um, panelists have to say. They're not going to be on for a tremendous amount of time, but we're going to give them an opportunity to be able to kind of, you know, even if you guys have questions in any of these markets, please let me know and I'll star them and ask them to our guest. Um, but yeah, I mean, as just as Todd said, there is so much going on. We are, what, less than two weeks away now from the new year. And so many people have been talking crash in 2024, crash in 2024. Is that really going to happen in 2024? Or is that going to be happening now in 25? I know that Todd's going to be bringing up some articles here, kind of looking at history on, you know, the correlation and how things are so similar to the way they were before, um, you know, back before the great financial crisis. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a good show. You talk about, uh, buyers canceling contracts and I see a comment contracts. What are they good for? I mean, it is crazy. The amount of buyers that are walking away from contracts. We had a situation where we just had a deal fall through because somebody lost their job. 
Um, I think that's kind of um, maybe not won't be very unique. Maybe I, you know, I know it's not fun to talk about, but um, you're not going to. I mean, if <laughs> if you're being qualified based on employment and you lose your job, you know, and this was the day before settlement too, which kind of really sucks. But um, but we are seeing an amazing amount. So, and I've said this before, and I know we have Emily on deck. We'll bring her in, but. Um, I've seen what I've, and I want to caution people that are selling their houses right now, uh, and agents that are listing agents. I want to caution you on this because, um, I think that you don't realize some agents don't realize, and some sellers don't realize just how tapped out and done buyers are. I mean, not just, and these are qualified buyers. These are not buyers that are, you know, don't have down payments and things like that. These are smart qualified buyers and agents are making big mistakes in my opinion by saying things like multi con you know multi offer multiple offer situation putting these deadlines you know uh where contracts are due and pushing pressure and i get it look if if you're fortunate enough that you have a house that's priced and you're getting multiple offers you need to be really careful because you can lose every single offer you have when you go back and say multiple offer, put your highest and best forward, because I've seen personally buyers backing out, very interested in the house, probably, you know, giving a decent offer, uh, you know, with very reasonable contingency expectations and boom, you know, they, they just backed right out and said, nope, not going to get into it. Not, not entertaining that. So, you know, you can actually be a seller and have an agent do that and lose every one of your offers and have to go back and make something up like well, I don't the, none of the offers were acceptable or something. Uh, you you have to be really careful because as we get into this tonight and talk about uh, unpacking this, we have a massive issue that no one wants to talk about, and that's buyers are they're ta they're fed up. The exuberance is so far from done. We're, we're going to compare and look at some articles where the same exact scenarios took place in 2005 and 2006. And we'll see how those buyers responded then. And we're seeing how the buyers are responding now. So if you're selling your house right now, don't look, agents, don't, don't start playing games. You better be stealthy and try and grab as many of these offers as you can and without offending people because you might lose them all. But let's bring in Emily. Let's find out what's happening in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, and then while we have Emily on, we'll, uh, hey, Emily, how are you? Emily, uh, I think you're muted. muted. Can you unmute yourself? All right. Here we uh, go. How are we? All right. Let's see. Okay. okay. Okay, in Santa Fe, um, I'm fine. I'm just trying to. I'm not going to look at myself because I'm 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 moving. I don't want to do that. You know, Todd, you're you're absolutely right about the storyline. Okay, it's a storyline. Rates went down. All of a sudden, it's time, you know, to get going. Right. Okay. When we look at the Santa Fe market today, I made a couple of phone calls to a lot of the brokers that I know. And there's two sets of markets that I can talk about pretty quickly. One is our special like golf, you know, luxury market. Okay. We have 31 properties on the market there. Okay. Um, six months ago, you were lucky if we had five. All right. We have 31 now and three pending. Okay. The storyline for my peers is, oh, the sky's falling. Right? You got to lower prices. You got to do this. The other way to look at it is if you're a buyer, is there's opportunities there. There's all this inventory, there's opportunities. Why is everybody just like thinking that there isn't anything? Okay. When we look at the condo townhome market here in Santa Fe, we have something, a rare number, blew me away. We have 123 properties total, 81 are active. 42 are pending. Again, opportunities. Six months ago, we had multiple offers all the time. 
on those markets. So there's a shift. Yeah. There's also a shift in attitude. Um, so we've got inventory here in Santa Fe. Brokers, my many of my peers will say there isn't any inventory. Okay, so buyers hurry up, right? So they're not paying attention to what they need to pay attention to. Um, Santa Fe is a destination market. Okay, I understand that uh, California dropped in sales about 16% last quarter. Uh, Austin is down, you know, Texas uh, is down 12%. These are our feeder markets. So many of my clients say, well, where are the, you know, where are the buyers? Well, they happen to be in Los Angeles. They might be in San Francisco. They're in Dallas. They're in Fort Worth. They're in Houston. And that's where they are. They're not here. They're there. All right. They're, they're there. And so are you, if, again, if you're a seller, you know, Todd, if, if you're, if you're selling, you really have to think about if you're motivated, time on market, the condition of your house, who your broker is, are they just going to put a sign in the yard and then say, Oh, the sky's falling. So that's why it didn't sell. And in seven days we have to have a price drop. No, no, no. You really have to get, you know, get some numbers behind you. So we we have those issues. Yep. We also have um, short-term rental rules, and we just had a transfer tax, a wealth tax, get passed, uh, which goes into effect in May, uh, end of May, 2024. So we have less cash buyers. Yeah. Are, are you seeing where your buyers are? Uh, I mean, what's the attitude of the buyers right now? Are the are the buyers like, you know what, we're going to we're going to hold off. We're going to wait. We're going to watch. I mean, if you tell a, a buyer right now that there's a multiple offer situation, are they going to move forward with it? Or are they more inclined to say <clears throat> I'm out? No, they're out. Here's a here's a stack. I don't know if you can see this. Here's a here's a here's a stack. OK. Buyers. OK. From third quarter they're not responding they're done yeah i mean one or two so you tell, gone, you but tell a buyer they're, they're they're interested in a house you tell a buyer um that uh, there's multiple offers and what are they doing are they saying now oh, don't worry about it i'm i'm good we'll oh, no we'll, we'll wait for it's the next no one. it's no it's yeah. no yeah it's always yeah no. and, that, always and that's what no. i think and, it's always been no and and right now they you know for the brokers in my you know we have 900 agents here in santa fe for the ones that put something in with a deadline okay you have seven days hurry up okay so then all of a sudden you're on day 15 and you're looking in the mls and you see you only had seven days but it's still active they don't even go back and change yeah, but, the deadline you know well i mean and, what, I they, mean, what I the just, agents what what they're doing at that point is, you know, they are they've got mud on their face, and I've seen agents play this game. You know, they have one offer in hand, right? And they'll try and pump it up and say, you know, hey, we got multiple offer. They have one offer, right? And then all of a sudden, everyone else backs out, and their one offer sucks, and the buyer or the seller doesn't take the offer, and now they're like, well, wait, what happened? You have multiple offers. What happened? You're saying that they're not even updating. They put a deadline in. You're still looking at the MLS. It's a week later. Right. They still, these agents, they're terrible. They still haven't updated their listing. They look, they look terrible. Their sellers should, no. If it well, was you know, me, yeah, I'd be sellers, firing them. Sellers need to be more involved. All right. Sellers need to be involved. Sellers need to be educated. Sellers need to understand what's going on. I mean, I think there's a lot of confusion and fear given the uh, litigation within, with NAR and the 13 or 14 lawsuits about compensation. Uh, I, I chair the education committee for our Santa Fe Association of Realtors, and most of them are in fear. You know, they're, they're in fear. Instead of, instead of picking up the phone and having a fierce conversation, at least 30 of them a day with somebody, so you can educate them about what's going on. Okay, if your phone's not ringing so or you're, they're you're in not fear, they're, they're in fear. Why? Because they feel that their career is being swept away from them. They had they they weren't prepared, Todd. They're not. They're for the downturn. Many of my peers, they weren't prepared for that, and also for 
what's going on in the housing market? Okay, if you ask somebody how much new construction do we have in Santa Fe? Oh, well, we have some here, we have some there, we have some in Las Campanas. Um, hello, we've got a lot of it, okay? But it's not, it's not in MLS. It's not in MLS. And so, you know, if you're if you're an agent and all you do is read the MLS every day, you don't have you, and you know, my view is you don't know what's going on. You don't yeah. know what's going on. And yeah. you know, the what other thing I do, uh, No, go ahead. What were you gonna say? Credit. People can't get you know, they can't get a loan. And the cash buyers that I currently have are not spending all their cash. They're spending part of it. Loan on the rest. Okay. So they're not going all cash. They really want the appraisal now. You know, it's not 2022. Yeah. I see a lot of people are saying that I'm blurry. Am I blurry, M Melissa? Am I fading out? You do look blurry to me, Todd, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Don't know. A little bit. Well, I apologize for that, guys. Hopefully, can you hear me all right? Is the audio okay? I can okay? hear you fine. Yes, I can hear you fine. So there was an article, um, and and I appreciate Emily you coming on. Um, uh, definitely there's an article in Housing Wire. I subscribe to Housing Wire. Um, and um this is talking about Altos research, and uh they said that, that there are now five hundred and thirty-nine thousand single family homes on the market unsold, which is up three point two percent. Uh, than last year at this time. So we're seeing a big uptick. I know there's a lot of shadow inventory. A lot of the home builders are not reporting uh, all of their inventory that they have. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to protect. I mean, look, I know there's, you know, bureaucrats that are publicly traded have to make sure that they are, you know, uh, careful with what they publish because they don't want to disappoint stockholders and have stockholders running for the hills and, you know, selling massive sell-offs and things like that. I think that everybody is trying to hold on. The worst part about our industry is that um, the worst part is that everything is backward looking data. So when we're looking at data that says, you know, mm -hmm. November data, what you have to understand is that's really coming from September. A lot of that is September because these contracts were put out you know, 30, 45 days before they closed. Uh, we know October was one of the worst months for price declines and seller contributions in a new home market. And we that's showing up. We know that there's, you know, over a million in uh, new starts, a million two, I think it is, in new starts. Uh, you know, we're going to be just under 4 million total sales this year, uh, which give or take a million. I mean, we're still talking... The difference this year was, yes, sales were down, but they sold quick and, you know, not as quick as last year. But I'm, I want to, Emily, we're going to, we're going to let you take off. We have a uh, page okay. on deck, but before we, we do that, do you have anything that you want to say, Emily, before you head out? Yeah. You know, there's one thing, uh, Todd, Lou Wallace was one of the territorial governors of New Mexico. He also wrote Ben-Hur. And one of the things that he's famous for when he was here was that every calculation based on experience um, elsewhere fails in New Mexico. Okay, so for me, you know, I can look at the macro numbers, but it's all about what happened today. You know, what happened today? Like we have 647 homes on the market now in Santa Fe, whereas Three months ago, we were lucky if we had 300, right? Double. So it's for me, it's what's Double going on today. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. Well, like I, I believe, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I believe that as soon as interest rates start dipping down and we get into the sixes consistently, uh, we just had in the last, uh, what was it? The last, this week, there were 11% more new sellers than last year at this time. This is weird. Sellers don't sell this time of year. It's weird. when what I think what sellers are doing is they're looking at this going, this is our opportunity to get rid of this place. You know, the interest rates are dropping right. down. Buyers can afford it. 
let's get out, you know? So, mm -hmm. right. well, we thank you, Emily. Thank we'll you, be Emily. In touch with you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Of course. Right, before, thank you. Talk to you before, soon. Before we bring in Paige, I want to dive in here, guys, because, you know, this is going to be the meat of tonight. <clears throat> we are listening. Now, listen to me. You are hearing a lot of stuff right now that doesn't pencil out. You're hearing where everything is great. Everything is not great. The debt is through the roof. Auto loan delinquencies are through the roof. Credit card delinquencies are through the roof. We're seeing, you know, delinquencies pick up in uh, mortgages. We're looking at another bailout on the table from the government that wants to bail out FHA for another three to five years to prevent foreclosures from happening. I want to take us to an article. This is a CBS News article dated April 25th, 2005. You all remember 2005? This is, this is what I think, guys, 2005 was 2022, right? This was last year. And as we li listen carefully, as we talk about this, all right, according to the National Association of Realtors, home prices rose last year more than 8.3% nationally. And suddenly it feels like the real estate selling season this year will be a repeat of the year before, and that's 2004, and the year before, 2003, et cetera, because from 97 until 2005, this, here we go, right? The question people are asking including include, will it last? And is there a housing price bubble? Do you realize this same thing was said in 2022. Is there a housing bubble? We said, yes. We said the exuberance was crazy. Other people said, no. Home prices only go up, right? It appears this is in 2005, before the GFC. There appears to be no shortage of experts who agree that although real estate prices have grown considerably, home prices are not likely to fall in a spectacular fashion that the stock market did in 2000. The consensus is real estate prices will likely grow, but at a slower pace. Sound familiar, guys? This is from 2005, just mm -hmm. to keep reminding you that. Not at the annual double-digit percentage growth experienced in 1997, since 1997. The arguments that the real estate and home prices will continue to rise indefinitely include a lack of available land, low interest rates, and a never-ending supply of baby boomers and foreign buyers stepping into the market. Hello? That what they said in 2022 was that there's a never-ending buyer pool of millennials. So it went from baby boomers to now millennials and still foreign investors buying up all the land, Canada being number one, China ranking up there. So what's the answer? Well, housing, home, house prices continue to rise or will the home price boom that began in earnest in 1997 turn into a bust? Well, let's see. According to Professor Schiller at Yale University, he, he gathered a series of data on, data on housing prices that go back 115 years, and the result was surprising. The U.S. has never experienced a home price bubble like the one that began in 1997, except for the period right after World War II when soldiers came home and went on a buying spree. His data also suggests home prices will generally appreciate about one percentage point above long-term inflation. Signs of an overheated real estate market include increasing number of buyers using interest only and negative amortization mortgages to finance nosebleed high purchase prices, counting on future appreciation to build their equity. Also, the National Association of Realtors, about 25% homes purchased last year were bought as investments, not as primary residents. Hello, does this sound familiar? 
We got up to 33%. We got up to 50 some percent in certain cities like in Texas. Potential trouble, trouble spots are in markets that have had double digit and triple digit price increases over the past five years. Let's stay on this for a minute. This Baltimore Sun article, May 1st, 2005. Again, I'm telling you, this is 2022. Houses are selling in mere days. Buyers are scrambling to outbid one another. Sellers are fetching well over the asking price. Contingencies such as home inspections are being dropped. All the better to seal the deal. 2022, 2021, 2020, right? Come on, this is a replay. The spring selling season has arrived, a time when homeowners traditionally put their homes up for sale, but the typically busy season is hardly typical this year. Only a trickle of homes coming on the market. I mean, this is crazy. As buyers line up to snap them up, even at hefty premiums. You get what I'm putting down here? Somebody oh, yeah. says, I bid over the asking price. And I didn't get it because somebody else waived the home inspection. The water wasn't turned on. There was no way to check the plumbing. And the furnace was to be installed. Even overbidding won't guarantee success. One of the clients bid $225,000 for a three-bedroom split level in Randallstown. This is local to our Baltimore market. $15,000 over asking price. He lost the, uh, the house to another buyer who shelled out two seventy. dollars to allow for such premiums, he has begun showing clients only home selling for substantially less than the client's qualified mortgage amount. It goes on, right? But check this out. Let's go to the bottom of that article. Mortgage interest rates, guys. Mortgage interest rates have stayed at historical lows, allowing buyers to qualify for a larger loan have propelled buyers into the market in numbers that are outpacing sellers. Realtors say a shortage of sellers could cause, could be caused by a number of factors. Guys. It's parallel. Real quick, the next article. This is a quick one. August 16th. We've progressed through 2005. U.S. home prices surged 13.6% in the second quarter, the fastest pace in more than a quarter of a century as a decline in interest rates fueled record sales. It goes on to say the continuing shortages of housing inventory are driving the price gains. There's no evidence of bubbles popping. Guys, this is 2005. But home builders, check this out. A gauge of U.S. home builders. And optimism fell in 22 when, um, amongst home builders. Just like 2005, according to a report yesterday, the National Association of Home Builders, the group noted concern about high land costs and a shortage of lots for construction. Wow. Let's bring Paige mm -hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Wait till, you, wait till we get to 2006, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to be blown at the comparisons, the similarities. I mean, it is unbelievable. Paige, how are you? Doing great. How are you? Hi, Paige. Doing well, Thank doing well. With us. Did, you, did you hear all that? Were you in the housing market in 2005? Yeah, I got my license in uh, 1996. So I've been through several different big things. I, I, will, I did want to make a quick comment about new construction. Here in my market, uh, the builders are not allowed to enter the inventory into the MLS until the home is at a certain stage. So there's always going to be, people call it shadow inventory, but the builders do have pretty decent representations of a few plans that with renderings or a few homes that have been built in another subdivision, if you will, and then explain in comments, you know, call for inventory. Uh, but Paige, that's not where they're mining the data to report to the consumers. They're not, do, they're, they're not accurately reporting it because the builders are not required to push it out there. And no one's required to use the MLS. First of all, no one, absolutely no one in our, in the listing agreement, 
a seller can deny being on the MLS. They could say, Absolutely. I don't want my home to be on the MLS. So, you know, the, they're, they're not breaking any laws, but the dishonesty in the reporting from like the National Association of Realtors or any of the reporting agencies, the dishonesty that they're reporting is that the numbers aren't accurate. They're not accurate. They should be saying this doesn't include all of the shadow inventory that's out there. They should yeah, be making disagree. that clear. Anyway, Paige, what's going on in your market, man? Tell us, tell us about your uh, your marketplace. Yeah, so we've had several things happen, and it's probably uh, indicative of other areas as well. I'm I'm 15 minutes outside of Atlanta, so we're in a big inventory. I, I would I bless her heart for being in Santa Fe, but having 600 homes in her market, I just looked right before I got on, and in the two counties surrounding me, so three total, there's uh, 2,500, um, and that's just within 30 minutes of where I'm sitting right now. So so we've have plenty of inventory. Should We would love to have more. But what's happened um, for the past 10 or 11 months specifically is our home, two things. One is our appreciation factor um, month over year over year by the month has been in the four or five percent range. And November to November was exciting from this standpoint. It was 8.9 percent appreciation rate. So we hadn't seen that in a while. Um, but prior to that, like you're reading the, and alluding to in those articles is, where did all the buyers go? You know, I, I own the uh, brokerage and I have other agents that I train and mentor and, and consult with on where to go get the business, you know, where to market. The, the first time home buyers specifically didn't disappear. They just have invisible ink on. Um, they, they have just making themselves invisible by renting and because of our interest rates. And, and it's more of this. It's more... And I was telling Melissa this today, it's more uncertainty. You know, when I buy stock on the stock market, I usually buy and sell at the wrong time. But the uncertainty gets me thinking. So as hopefully if the feds are going to do what they said they were going to do, you know, and, and slow it down and not do any more rate increases and maybe have three rate decreases, buyers will come back. But what happened was, is we had just like you said, I think you said in your Baltimore market, it was up to 40% on a given month for um, investor purchases. And therefore we have a flood of rental properties. I just picked one up um, two weeks ago and I'm a little hesitant on what I thought I could get for my monthly rent. I'm actually predicting $200 less a month. But my point is those home buyers, as they see certainty and things leveling off or in my opinion, and what I'm hearing are going to jump into the market. Um, and that will be interesting. And since we don't have a lot of supply, we have a decent amount. I am I just don't know where that's going to go. Paige, what percentage of your inventory, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, has come on? So you say 2,700 homes in three markets around you. Um, outside of Atlanta, you're in uh, Marietta, um, mm -hmm. 2,700 homes. Do you know what percentage of that active inventory just came on the market in the last 10 days? Yeah, I just looked, you were talking about in your opening statement. So I scrambled to get in my MLS if you were to ask that question. Um, right around 350-ish out of 20, I think the number mm -hmm. was 2,451 total. And that's three counties. Um you know, I could have gone out further, but it's just basically 30 minutes of conference of where I'm at. Now, is that odd for this time of year to have a, you know, um, 10, I think 12 so. percent increase in, you know, uh, inventory being under 10 days old? And, and if I had to guess, um, yeah, I, if I had to guess, I'm sure it's several things, you know, end of the year push. I, I tend to I don't know other markets. I just know where I'm at, what I've been doing over the last a couple decades, I get real, and I am, I'm really busy over the holidays. It just seems to be that last push. You have all kinds of reasons. You've got the buyers who want a savvy deal. You've got investors that want to spend the money. You've got 1031 tax exchanges. You get that money off the off the table. I, I don't know that that's out of line. It does appear to be um, interesting. And, and I think, again, like you had mentioned, there are people that have moved into other family members' homes that have a home to sell or whatever the scenario is. Let's just say they have a home to sell and have waited 
and now start seeing it's time to sell. So my market is this. This is what I tell my sellers right now. I'm actually encouraging not putting something on the market. And I'll tell you why. So our two highest listing volume months are May is number one or right around May. And then February is, is number two. And that's the holiday hangover, if you will. Uh, that's the, hey, I think I want to put it on the market, but I don't really want people in my home during the holidays. Um, I don't let my sellers, unfortunately, you know, Christmas at grandma's, not at the house we're selling. It's too much clutter. Yeah. At your 2,400 listings that are on the market, what percentage of them have had at least one price reduction? Oh, that would have been a great thing to research. Our typical market, it may be the same there. It's it's usually a three week, uh, excuse me, a four week mark, a 30 day benchmark where agents will in the transactions I'm doing, I'm hearing that that's how their broker trains the, their agents. What I was seeing or what I am seeing is to answer your question more intelligently is the agents that are less than intelligent. That's the nicest way to say it. Uh, the agents that are newer <laughs> are listening to or letting there's a the lot sellers. Of, there, there's a lot of existing agents, man. They're, they're, not, they're not new and they're not very intelligent. Yeah, we have about 200,000 in my market. So if you can just imagine. The time uh, in the industry has nothing to do with their competency. Yeah. If you're a yeah, broker, I, you get that. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot and of Yet they don't want to come to sales meetings. Yeah. <laughs> They're too good to come to sales meetings. Uh, prima donnas. That's what I didn't want to say. Uh, yeah. You but can say I, it on this show. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I think, though, what I was getting at is I think sellers are we don't hold, dictating. We don't, we don't hold back. I love it. I'm a direct guy. So, you know, sellers dictate a lot of things. And if the agent doesn't have control of it, not that you have to control anyone, but you have to be wise in counseling and showing and, and not just giving an opinion. A realtor gives an opinion, needs to be shot in the head. You need to back it up by facts. And this is what works. And this is what doesn't. And this is why. Yeah, well. What do you think about and you? Obviously, on deck, you were listening to me compare uh, 2022 to 2005. There were a lot of uh, narratives that were being pushed that really, uh, you know, are similar. Uh, just to give you some highlights here uh, to, and to get your opinion moving forward, Paige, because you've been in the business for a long time. I've been in the serving the housing industry. Uh, since 1989, uh, not in the capacity of broker or agent, but in the capacity of contractor, builder, developer. Um, and so, I mean, I was on the money side of things a lot different than the agents. The agents didn't start crying back in 2005 until 2008 that they didn't have money. Uh, builders were feeling it in 2005. Right. Because what was happening was as soon as the buyers, just like now, got tapped out, if you wanted to sell your inventory, you had to drop the price and you had to give concessions. So we started seeing the downhill spiral in 2005, three years before the agents started crying. OK, they were still getting commission checks. If a builder had to drop one hundred thousand dollars and go to the table with a twenty five thousand dollar cash payment to get out from underneath of the property that they were selling, the agents still made their commission. So they would they care, right? They still got paid. They just got paid a, off of a hundred thousand dollar less price. If it was seven fifty nine and it sold for six fifty nine, you know, they still got their money on the six fifty nine. And I'm look, I'm, I, I'm in, a, I'm a broker too. I manage agents, you know, and I'm not saying that agents, that there are a lot of great agents in this industry. And I think that, the biggest disservice we could do is to broad, you know, brush stroke and say agents are terrible and we don't need them. We do need them. We absolutely, absolutely. need them. Buyers need them. Sellers need them. 100% we need them. So we have to watch what we wish for with all these freaking lawsuits that are out there. I'm not almost called them stupid, but I'm not saying that they are because there may be some validity and some underlying. And I know the industry screwed up a lot. And in a lot of cases, there needs to be reprimand in, you know, people that have truly been harmed. Right. So I'm not I'm not disagreeing or saying I, I'm not going to say it's frivolous. I didn't sit in the courtroom. Uh, but anyway, back in 
2005, the Fed dropped rates to near zero. We can look at this. Let's look at the effective rate, Joe. Let's pull it up. Let's. We have the uh, Fed effective rate. And guys, what this is, is when we hear about j Powell and the interest rates and blah, blah, blah. What we're list, what we're really focusing on here is the Fed is not talking about dropping mortgage rates. That has to do with, you know, traditionally treasury bonds, the 10 year treasury bond, right? So there's usually a, you know, a markup on that where somewhere around whatever the 10 year treasury is hovering at, a point and a half, two points above that is where we typically will see a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. Okay. When we're talking about the Fed rate and J Powell coming out, talking about pivoting or reducing rates, things like that, these are the effective rates or the overnight trading rates where money is borrowed to provide loans, consumer loans that are a lot of like revolving loans, you know, um, home equity lines of credit would be in, involved in that car loans would be involved in that credit card loans. You know, you go buy, you know, furniture, uh, you know, a lot of those consumer loan products are affected by the fed rate. Okay. The overnight trading rate. But when we look in 2005, I mean, you can see where they drop that rate down really low and go down, Joe, into 2004, because that really spawned, um, keep going down right there, we're 1%. Now, this time, the Fed dropped it to zero. And after the, the when we saw the, the peak of the great financial crisis in 2006 about nationwide and home prices, then we saw them take it all the way down to zero. We know that that wasn't the best thing that they could have done because from that point on, we saw the rebound in the massive bubble that we have now. I don't know why they think it's a good idea to just get involved with this interest rate business. They should just let free market take its you know, uh, toll on goods and services and what people can afford. And if people can afford it, they'll buy it and they'll finance it. If they can't, they won't. But when we artificially play with these numbers and it lets the banks suck us in to get in debt and then they whack us when we're already in debt. So now we built our credit card up to debt to have $5,000 in credit card debt or more, $10,000, or we financed the car for seven years at 10,000 over MSRP because we had to have a car. We had to have a new car because we, you know, we needed it. And they didn't have inventory. So now that these rates are fluctuating, but that's what we're talking about. But anyway, the Fed dropped the rate up you know, that led up to the great financial crisis. They questioned whether it was a bubble in 2005. They questioned it in 22. No one wants to say we're in a real estate bubble. Do you think we're in a bubble? I think you got a lot of definitions and not a lot of clarity. I, you know, the, the situation then I, in an overall picture is different than it is now, but you have all the same things lining up. I'm buying what you're selling for sure. Um, well, tell, let me clear it up for you. What do you want clarified? Let me clear it up for you. You know, Paige, as well as I do, people are struggling. I mean, without, you know, a, a price drop or a 3.25 mortgage rate. How are these people going to get in the homes? How are they going to buy? How does the average working class American buy a home right now? Well, I can tell you this when in it's my market. five, seven, eight times earnings. You're in a very wealthy area. Yeah, but I'm in a very affordable area too. I mean, my first time home buyer price is still in the 300s, you know, so there's affordability here. It's not, obviously, it's not what it used to be. When prices did jump, we had a big, we've always been a big market with a little market pricing. We're finally now the big market with almost big market pricing. I don't know, my my two cents are, and, and I won't, you know, we don't have to go into all this, but I think you had a lot of the, 
secondary market bond ratings that were, you know, not rated correctly. And that caused a crash that, you know, the consumer didn't have anything to do with. And, you know, you had uh, First Franklin. And, they bought and the house. Names. They, yeah, they bought yeah, the house. Well, we also had lending I issues mean, they, there too. You know, no docs, stated income. I had somebody call me from McDonald's and said I was supposed to call you to for you to get a home uh, for me to get a home with you under contract. I'm like, oh, okay, let's get you pre-qualified. I already have that figured out. Come to find out, she, you know, I did a stated income loan for uh, eighty thousand dollars as a cashier at McDonald's. True story. So I was like, no, we're, I can't help you. So you know, we ha- that that isn't going on now, but um. You don't That's think kinda... that FHA man is like the new subprime market? I mean, they 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 don't report. Look, they don't report medical bills to credit reports. They don't report tax liens to credit reports. They don't report, you know, um, student loans to to your credit report. As far as you know, the fact that you haven't paid it in three years. I mean, if you look at it, the entry, you know, the entry um, is so low that you can buy a house with literally next to nothing down because they have first time home buyer grant programs where you can get $10,000. You can do all these different things. I mean, these people have no idea how to take care of a house. Uh, you know, and, and now we've been propping them up to the tune of millions of homeowners would have been foreclosed on had we not kept them bailed out for the last three years post COVID the only difference between now and then is the government's bailing them out. Had the govern- government not been bailing these homeowners out, we would already be looking at something worse than the GFC, and we've already pre-bailed out banks. And we know the bank, the banks are insolvent. So many banks are insolvent right now. And, you know, they're looking at, I mean, it's like, it had the government not it had I tell you what, and and I'm not arguing with you, Paige. I love I look, I, I respect you, man. I love the fact that you've got a lot of experience in this business. But you know what people need to realize is if they would have done the things that they're doing and have been doing for the last three years, when they started to see the banks collapsing, the GFC, the fallout, people losing their houses, they were slow to respond back then. They thought that they, I mean, they, you heard it, but since World War II, we never saw anything like that before. Home prices only went up. It's still, even despite the bubble of 2006 and the housing affordability index nationwide, home prices were still affordable for the median income earner. They were above the 100 line. It was not until 2020, the end of 2020 and 2021 in the history dating back decades, including the great financial crisis where the HAI is under 100% for the first time, even dating back to the GFC. Man, if we didn't have all of these programs in place, we would be looking at, and now FHA is coming out with this new program. They're trying, they put it out in in May for everybody's opinion. Now they want this new program that is going to credit bar, you know, FHA uh, borrowers up to a thousand dollars. I think it is on their mortgage payment. And they're going to, they're going to reduce their mortgage payment. Despite everything that's already been done, they're going to reduce their mortgage payment for a minimum. They don't want to go back to the well. They don't want this thing to sunset in like a year. They're making these borrowers that qualify for this, that need it. They're making them do it for a minimum. The the pitch is they want them to do it for at least three years and up to five years. Now, if we go back, some of these people haven't been current on their mortgages since pre-pandemic, right? I would imagine. So we're talking about 2020, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, nine years maybe by the time eight years of some type of forbearance or modification. That's not good. That's not healthy. That's not a healthy housing market. Who pays for all that, number one? And number two, 
How do we not talk about this more? Why isn't this being talked about how the housing market isn't healthy? In fact, it's unaffordable, right? That's the crisis that we're in. And, you know, I think that 2005, six, seven, and eight pale, pale in comparison because the banks are in worse position with the amount of, you know, price loan prices on the books and you know anyway that's just my that's that's my take on it i could be 100 percent wrong right i could be 100 percent wrong but anyway page so what so you're seeing right now what are your expectations for 24 and then we'll let you go yeah i, I was telling melissa earlier that i think a lot of it has to do with and, you, and you're alluding to it as well as if you take the parties of Demo of politics out of it. Um, over the past several presidents and president administrations, we've had some pro real estate. Um, the administration we have it now is not as pro real estate or hasn't done enough in my market, our market to assist with that, in my opinion. And here's how I look at it. If that particular president gets reelected, it's going to be more of the same, whomever it is, whichever party, it is, it should and probably will be substantially better because I think there's some intolerance. There's tolerance that's happening now that won't happen with other administrations, if you follow what I'm saying. And uh, I look forward to that. So what I see is as rates hopefully stay the same or come down, I think you have a buyer influx into my market. I Unfortunately, see exactly what you're seeing with overinflated home prices and what the young lady said from Santa Fe is going to happen here. It is going to be multiple bids. I just got an email right before I came on the show with a buyer. We're in multiple offers with that. So that's just crazy. You know, buyers shy away from it. They don't like it, but it's coming again. It's because our supply is low and those first time home buyers are going to flood the market and i'm afraid sellers are always behind they're always a month or two behind from realizing what's going on because they're not in the market buyers are in the market and are sitting on the sidelines so they've been in the market if you will in the, in their headspace yeah well i mean that's we'll see i mean we'll see what happens um uh, you know i think we're on the cusp of another downhill spiral uh, myself I, I don't think that saving, dropping the rates are going to save the housing market. Um, I don't have the same buyer confidence that a lot of people share. And I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not knocking on people. Like I said, I could be 100% wrong. But I talk to people as you do that, I mean, they're, they're, people are struggling. I think we're underestimating the amount of hardship that people are going through right now that are working two and three jobs. To well, make let's talk about something we haven't. This is a yeah, large just, percentage. Yeah, let's touch on one thing real quick. So who's going to trade a 2% mortgage for a 7% mortgage? So that's your step up buyer. We haven't talked about that. Or seller. Sellers become buyers first, right? So they go and think that they want to buy something when they're before they even sell. So I think we're dealing in a recession type. Like, what did I do? What did you do during the recession? All I did was work investors and first time home buyers because rent equal to mortgage payments. So that was they're buying no matter what. There was fewer of them, but I think that's where we're heading. So just to clarify a little bit of what I'm talking about, I don't see the step up buyer market unless they're relocating and they have to. And that's all I've done this year. If they have to relocate and they are buying right. above a first time home buyer market, that's all I'm doing. Yeah. Right. They're domestically migrating and, you know, they sold their house in California for five million dollars and they're buying cash and kind of. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's true. I think, though, that the inventory, we're going to see an influx in inventory. You know, we have shy of uh, immigration, uh, you know, and we always have immigration, uh, whether they're coming across the border legally or illegally. We're always having immigration into the United States, uh, but we are on a population decline and it's, it, it has been in for many decades. So it's not the fact that we don't have enough in housing inventory. And it's also not because we we're not building enough. I think that we, it, during the COVID pandemic, um, we saw more people buy second houses than ever before. I mean, yeah, they were happening 
in also the market of 2005 and 2006, there were a lot of people buying second homes, vacation homes and things like that, upgrading their houses and stuff that, and they got into financial debt. And when the interest rates or, you know, costs exceeded and unemployment rates started to rise, it did not take long for people to realize that they were really screwed. And I don't think it's going to take that long now for people to realize it either. I mean, I think we're already seeing bankruptcies, uh, you know, uh, rise. We're already starting to see tax sale delinquencies. We're already starting to see where people, you know, are having their mortgage company uh, put a high risk policy because they haven't been able to pay their insurance. Um, you know, insurance has doubled certain areas. You know, you're looking at insurance that has been canceled um, in certain places where there's high hurricanes and floods and forest fires and things like that. But I think, you know, you're right. I mean, if, if they don't have to move, they're not going to. But I think there are a lot of people that do. You're always going to have divorce. You, you're, there's articles out there right now where there's more people getting divorced that are living together because they don't have a choice, right? They're keeping the house, um, you know, because they, you know, whatever the reason is. But I think, you know, that's going to be, you know, always having, you know, people pass on and they go through hardship, they divorce and people move in with families. You have a silent generation that's moving out. You have baby boomers that are retiring and coming on. We have a huge amount of inventory. These baby boomers that were buying in 2005 flooding the market are now retiring and, and downsizing. And a lot of them are moving in with family. So I think, you know, all of this is, in my opinion, inflated BS that is going to get kicked down the can down to whatever administration's in place in 2000 and uh and 25 that's my opinion uh, but anyway we appreciate you Paige. thanks so much for jumping on here page thank and you we'll talk to you soon thank you okay talk to you soon and you know before we before we pick up with our next uh agent that's coming in mm -hmm. um i do want to go over 2006 because that's what you know we're getting closer now 2006 i think is like now 2023 and i want to kind of go over that and then we'll take some uh, we'll take some comments and some questions. But let's pull up in a July article in the Baltimore Sun. Um, it says uh, home sales down 22 percent from a year ago. So hey, this is 2023, right? Actually, this article is 2006. But what do we know about 2023? We know that home sales are down, and I think the 22 percent is a fair. Uh, calculation. Some people say that they're 30 some percent. Some markets are down 40 percent year over year in sales. But hey, I like this number because it's conservative. Let's say that now we've gone from 2005 to 2006 or 2022 to 2023. Sales are down. Housing sales in the Baltimore area skidded more than 22 percent last month from June of 2005 levels, the biggest drop in seven years. Rapid price appreciation in the past years eroded affordability, making it more difficult for people to buy homes. Rising interest rates, sound familiar, have eroded real estate's stature as a hot investment. I think if you asked a lot of buyers right now, they'd tell you not a good investment at all. Home sellers increasingly are disappointed to find that they need to drop their price or offer cash for closing costs to entice buyers. Or let's say this, fix things in the house that they didn't have to do last year, you know, in now we're in 22, in the beginning of 22, they didn't need to fix stuff in their house. Here we go. This is, this is big. Buyers don't feel the pressure they did last year. For instance, last year, if they liked what they saw, they were paying what? Ever they thought it would take to buy a place, and this is in the next article. But I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk it out. In 2006, right? This is the year we're talking about here that we're comparing to this year, 2023. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and his successor Ben Bernanke, after reviewing home sales 
and mortgage rates in the fall of 2006 were hopeful that the bottom had market had that the market had bottomed out ladies and gentlemen is that not what we're hearing right now is that not i mean this is like deja vu am i the only one that sees this exactly forget the fact of the subprime loans. I just told you, we just came through a period of time of exuberance and people bought just like they did back then. People paid top dollar. They paid over asking price, over appraisal price, right? It doesn't matter what loan they have. If they can't afford the payment, they now, they didn't have jacked up insurance rates like they do now. They don't have jacked up HOA rates like they do now. They didn't have the credit card debt that we do now. They weren't buying cars at seven for seven years. They didn't just come through a period where they paid $20,000 over MSRP for a car like they did now. I mean, this doesn't make sense to me. If it makes sense to you, I mean, if you guys know something that I don't know, I don't have the money printing machine, but unless they airdrop money to everybody, Somebody may get it. Mm -hmm. Let's take a couple questions and then we'll. I know Josh is so patiently waiting on deck. We're getting to you, Josh. We'll be there right. in one moment. Um, but some questions. We do have some super chats that I would like to get into real quickly. Um, Cove, thank you so much. Yet again, every week you are super chatting us. I appreciate that very, very much. Oh. In my opinion, the crash happened at the tail end of years of low rates. The Fed's hand was forced to raise rates, thus stress testing the small banks and consolidating the field and giving slight relief to the burdened big banks. Well, we'll and see what happens now that all those loans to the banks are sunsetting. Here it was for a year. The bailout was for a year. So now we're, we're coming up into March. Uh, will the banks have the money to pay back the, uh, you know, the the government? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Goes on to say, thank you again. The you will own nothing and be happy policy is not for Americans' well-being. It's a massive consolidation to keep the big banks from going completely broke. And we've got yeah, what's well, the investors, one. right? I mean, I, I, I was mm -hmm. watching a uh, video with Jamie Dimon, um, you know, the CEO of uh, JP Morgan uh, Chase. Man, I was, this guy's got, man, this guy's got way, 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 way too much power, in my opinion. Um, 300,000 employees, I think they said. Um, they're every, I mean, they're in multiple countries. I mean, they're big in China. Um, you know, it's scary to think about, uh, you know, um, how much control a bank like JP Morgan has because they are too big to fail. I mean, the go I mean, I, I, you know, I don't even want to say what I wanted to say, but they, they, they the, the government, <laughs> man, what will it cost to bail them out? If, if need be, I mean, banks right now. So there's all kinds of articles out. You can check them out. You can go through Google, whatever, just put in commercial loans. There are so many loans that have already, um, you know, uh, come up for renewal. The banks are doing nothing in a lot of the cases because they don't want the properties. You know, what, what we were talking about before was the bank would say, all right, um, we gave you $5 million for this building. I'll just use small numbers because a lot of them are much bigger than that, but let's just use the small number scenario. It's an owner occupant, maybe a business owner has their office in the building and their more, loan commercial loan came up for refinance. <clears throat> and the, let's say the balance is 5 million. What the bank should do is look at, you know, they have maybe multiple tenants should look at their financials and say, well, this is office space. We're not even interested in financing office space, but we'll give you the refinance, but not at 5 million. We'll give it to you at three. You need to put 2 million down in cash. Well, it's no surprise. The building owner 
doesn't have the $2 million in cash. So what the bank should be doing is foreclosing on that property. They should be foreclosing on the property and taking it back, taking whatever that borrower probably has recourse. But the banks and a lot of these articles you read are doing nothing because they're like, what are we going to do? I mean, so many of these loans have ballooned. What are they going to do? The people don't have the money to pay it. They don't have the income to even pay the mortgage in a lot of cases with the higher interest rates. What are they going to do? I mean, Grant Cardone's been all over the internet. Now, you know, he's a big real estate investor saying that this is going to be the an epic, you know, event. It's going to be catastrophic in like we've never seen before, an epic event in the commercial real estate industry. All of these regional banks are at the cusp of taking all of these properties and becoming insolvent that, that they can't get refinanced. It's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. Everybody's been pushing debt, 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 debt. Oh, the mm -hmm. bank. Let me tell you something. That is not what you want to be. You do not want to be in that situation. Well, unfortunately, Any a lot of more people super don't have, we want to get to yeah, that. that option. Uh, yep, we have one more super chat. We are in a real estate plunger, and the banks, along with the Fed, are working the handle, cleaning up the mess in the toilet. With a backup plan of Americans' cash and retirement, they ran wild. Yeah, that's yep. crazy. Cobb, we appreciate you. Let's take a look at it. Uh, well, let's go ahead and pull. Let's let's go ahead and bring Josh in. Hey guys, thanks for having me, Hi. Josh. What's up? How buddy? you guys doing? Boise, good. thanks for being here. Yeah. Okay, we're Boise, good. Idaho. Tell us what's happening, man. Yeah, in Boise, it's an interesting market that we have right now. Um, new construction is still given away a lot of money anywhere from 20 to forty thousand dollars just to get the inventory moved but our sales are down uh, on average as a whole our sales are down about 10 percent or 14 percent, depending on which county you're looking at so our sales have been dropping year over year uh, kind of like what you're saying and um and then our rental inventory has skyrocketed too i mean we have like over 1600 available rentals in our market and so when you think about is the the reduction in and in the interest rates really going to change i don't know if it's going to change that much because these rentals are half the price of what it would cost to build it and so why would you why would you get rid you know out of a rental to go buy and we already have so much apartments and single family homes that can't get rented out as as it is you know so josh um here's the crazy part man a year ago those rentals would have had a hundred applications on them I mean, you know, when we we had it same way here. I mean, it's like, yeah, do you want to take a rental and list it? You want to tell these people just put it on Zillow or something else, and good luck. Go find your own tenant. I mean, we used to have, you know, because I mean, they're like, why can't my part my my house rent? Well, because no one wants to pay you what you want for it. You know, it's like, hello. So when we see tenants saying no, we forget. Amnesia is very, you know popular amongst mm -hmm. you know consumers that listen to mainstream media right because because what you heard a year ago has just gone away right in 2022 when millions millions of millennials moved back home millions mm -hmm. we forget about that now where are all the renters well, they can't afford $2,700 for a single family house at 35 years old or 30 years old. They don't want a roommate. They had that back in college. They don't want to get a I mean, they don't want to live with four other adults. They want to get their life together and, 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 you know, have something right. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're saying, look, I can't even afford a eight, a 700 square foot apartment in Nashville, Tennessee. It's $2,000 a month. For yeah. one bedroom, one bath, the bathroom is in the bedroom. And all of my friends that come over to visit me have to go into my personal space because I don't even have a half bath to have people yeah. come over in my apartment. 
right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous. But yet we're yeah. going to have a glut of apartments hit the market like we've never seen before. If we don't think rentals coming down, you know what these investors said? And I'm a real estate investor myself, but I never said this. They said rents will never come down. Historically, it's never happened before. Well, let me introduce you to historically. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, because and, if you and, don't and, think... Yeah. yeah. I mean, Josh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, like, like right now, I just read an article that we had the, mo uh, the most amount of apartment inventory hit the market in three decades. And so, you know, we're seeing this mat and, and, and here in 2024 and 2025, we're going to see the same amount, um, enter the market that is currently under construction. And these guys are, are stuck on commercial loans, right? So they're not stuck to the 30 year amortization. Say so they're based off of commercial loans and they only get to hold that for five, 10, 10 years before they have to refinance. And it's going to be a bloodbath. Already see it. Already yeah. see it. These a lot of these places are, I mean, they're going to sell for 30, 40, 60 cents on a dollar. And that may be too much. I mean, a lot of the people right. that are looking at it are like, man, I don't even know if I want to buy for that. Right. Because deferred maintenance, you know, a lot of them have been kicking the can down the road on the maintenance. And now you're going to have all kinds of regulations on these apartment buildings and, you know, uh, they're already starting. The, a lot of the governments are, you know, starting with the uh, rent controls and things like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, who knows, man? I think I think landlording is a thing. I mean, you're going to the big corporations that can weather massive losses are probably going to be the ones that can pick these up you know, for pennies on the dollar, you know, they've got a lot of money in reserves that can raise a lot of money to grab this stuff up. But a lot of these operators are going to go bust. What about inventory? What are you seeing happen in single family home inventory? Yeah. So our inventory is still tight. I mean, we have, uh, our inventory has dropped, but I think part of that too is, is sellers are kind of in this denial. Um, we have the people who are, are short selling and foreclosing in our market, you know, they're only taking a hundred. And I, I say that, uh, candidly, they're only taking a hundred thousand dollar loss in a short sale. So like last week we saw three houses that took a hundred thousand dollar loss on a short sale, but these guys are actually going to make it out better because they're taking it now rather than waiting a year. And they're going to, these people that are going to wait are going to have to take 200, $250,000 loss. And so the inventory is tight because people are in denial that the market's going to turn around and be better next year or the year after. And, and that's kind of, kept the inventory tight, but people are struggling. People are struggling all over. And, and, and that's why I brought up the whole rental thing, because if somebody is paying a $4,000 mortgage and that same house can only be rented for $1,600, they can only hold on to that for so long. And I mean, in our, in our Metro, hmm. the median household income is only $76,000. And, but yet for an entry level house, if you were to buy it, you're going to be paying $4,000 a month on a mortgage based off the uh, today's interest rate. So why would you go out and buy a house? And so the, anyways, so there's these inventory that's sitting, that's waiting, in my opinion, that's waiting to hit. And when we talk about new construction, well, there's those people are actually moving inventory because they're willing to drop the price. And we have the, the inventory that's sitting on it now is, is sellers are just kind of, no, I'm not going to drop my price until it's too late. I have buyers right now that are looking for a house and um, we've been looking for quite some time. They're very patient. Um, I feel like I have to talk them off the ledge every now and then because they get a little upset when, um, you know, they're not finding what they're looking for at, for the price that uh, they feel they should pay. And we looked at a house um, that went on the market that as a rental. Now the owners bought the house just two years ago in 2021 and they've already moved out and um, they bought it for 680. It's on the market, I think for 3,700 for rent. Those numbers don't pencil out, hmm. right? I mean, it, when you look at the, the mortgage and the taxes and insurance, I mean, and now you're going to put somebody in there that potentially won't take care of the place and you might need to go in and spend twenty or $30,000. And so what my buyer said was, hey, can you ask them if they would be willing to sell it? So I called the agent and the agent was so cocky and said, sure, make them an offer as long as it's over what they paid for it in 2021. It better be good because otherwise they're not going to sell it. They're going to wait it out for another year 
And I was thinking to myself, buddy, where that <laughs> property is, we'll probably not see the price that your buyers paid for a decade. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I hope they're ready to sell it, you know, uh, in 10 years, if they're right. lucky. Yeah. But you're right. For the prices, they don't pencil out. And, and that's what aggravates me about some of these people that get on television and talk about these, you, you know, um, this, the uh, homeowners. They're never mm -hmm. going to get rid of the house because of the golden hand. You know, they've got a low interest rate. If they need to move, they'll just buy a house somewhere else. And, in, you know, and then they'll um, rent it. You can't, not only are they going to have to buy a house somewhere else, but they're going to have to spend a couple thousand dollars equivalent a month, $24,000 mm -hmm. a year just to keep the house because the rent that they're collecting isn't going to pay the bills. So right. it, people, when they say stuff, they pop off like this and they say stuff that doesn't make sense. They comment it doesn't make sense. I, I feel bad for people sometimes. I feel sorry for them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you, you don't even know what you're saying. You don't have no right. idea what you're saying. People are not just going to pack up, keep their house that they overpaid for in 2021 and stick a renter in there because they have to move. They're going to cut the price and sell the house because they have to. You're saying they're taking $100,000 drops in price. This is going to be yeah. the case for a lot of people. And here's the other thing that people don't realize. If you bought a new home in a new home community, and you need to sell it, and you just bought that house two years ago, and the builder's still building and struggling to sell homes in that community. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in trouble. I mean, I, yeah, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you because the builder's competing with you, and somebody's going to go, okay, the house that you've lived in for two years, where the carpet already needs to be replaced, or this new house right here with new everything. Hmm. For the same price, or maybe even a yeah. little bit less. Yeah, and and that's what we're. I mean, every single week we're seeing we're seeing some sellers that are realizing the state of the housing market, and they're like, okay, I I can break even, or I got to come with forty thousand, and I'm going to cut my losses and go. But then you have a lot of other people that are like, nope, I'm going to kind of like we we're saying, I paid for this, and I want to get this, and next year I'm going to get it. But the signs of what's coming doesn't show that they're really going to get it. I mean. There's, there's been more and more people that are like, I'm, I'm getting ready to list my house here in January, here in February, because, you know, this is going to be the best time. And I just, uh, I just, I just see, as you see the, the new construction driving home prices down, the people who are doing resales are really going to get kind of kicked, kicked in the pants there. So, yeah. Well, Josh, we appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, telling us what's happening in your market. Uh, so thank you. And we'll be in touch. Yeah, we'll absolutely. Okay. Have you back. Thank you, Josh. All right. Take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Before, before we bring, I know uh, we we have an agent that's in Honolulu. Uh, Patrick. Which mm -hmm. is, yeah, kind of cool. But uh, before we do that, I want to advance us on our year comparison because I want to talk about how 2007, I think, will be a lot like or what 2007 was like will be a lot like 2024. So let's go ahead and pull this article up. Um, it was on CNN, uh, money.cnn.com. It was published at the end of 2007. So if we have to put ourselves in sort of like a mindset here, so far, you have to admit, the articles have pretty much matched up almost verbatim on yeah. what's happened. 2005 right? Six to 2022 and 2023. And now we're going to talk about 2024 and how I believe we're going to look at 2007 and say, wow, man, there was a lot of similarities right before the massive bloodbath. Let's dive into this article. December 28th, almost where we are now, right? End of the year. Mm -hmm. Instead, all right, here we go. They're talking about in the beginning of this, before you put much hope into 2008, right? <laughs> Look, they still didn't know. 
I mean, they're still talking about, I mean, they're watching sales fall. They're watching people get foreclosed on. I mean, it's a, like, it's not a pretty scene in 2007, right? And we saw the peak in 2006, like we saw the peak in 2022, 2000, you know, around June of 2022. But anyway, here we go. A year ago, at this time, many top economists were looking at recovery to begin in 2007. Instead, the year saw historic declines in nearly every measure of housing strength and home building and left a trail of predictions from some of the nation's top economists that look at best foolish. It, too, it may be too soon. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan and his successor Ben Bernanke, after reviewing home sales and mortgage rates in fall of 2006, were hopeful, hopeful that the market had bottomed out. Remember, we were talking about that just a minute ago. It may be too soon to say that it's over. It may be too soon to say that the worst is over, said Greenspan in October 2006 speech in Richmond, according to press reports. But in November 2006 speech, Bernanke said he saw some encouraging signs in recent housing reports. Although residential construction continues to sag, some indications suggest that the rate of home purchases may be stabilizing, perhaps in response to modest decline in mortgage rates. Over the past few months and lower prices in some markets. Guys, this is exactly Sounds what's very coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we're talking lowering mortgage rates. We're seeing home prices starting to weaken. This is going to roll us right into 2024. Yep. So let's bring uh, Patrick. Let's bring in Patrick. What's hey going on, guys? How are you? Hey, how are you? Patrick. How are you, man? It's good. It's winter in Hawaii, uh, which is still pretty sunny. A little bit of rain, but nothing too much to complain about. Yeah, what's the temperature? Uh, we are at a brisk, brisk full seventy-five degrees. Yeah, sweater weather for time. us. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was talking to somebody who was in Miami over the, let's see, over the weekend, and it was like record-breaking winds. I mean, it was like a Category One hurricane winds or something like that. And we got them here in Maryland, knocked our. Uh, knocked a lot of power out, took trees down over the last couple of days. So it's been cold and windy. Uh, so I'd take sunny and, and 75 any day. So what are you seeing? Tell us about Honolulu, man. You got to have like uh, Oahu. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, Hawaii. Oahu. Hawaii itself is, um, and specifically Honolulu, uh, which is the island of Oahu. A lot of people don't know. They think Hawaii, it's like there's a, a chain of islands, right? And each island itself is its own market. Now we have one of the most, I'd say, booming markets out of all the islands because we have multiple markets. We've got, um, you know, the local people, we've got the military. We have pretty much every branch of military that's out here so that they end up buying a lot of homes. You've got uh, investors, remote workers, snowbirds, Chinese foreigners, you know, you've got anybody and everybody who's looking to buy in Hawaii because it's naturally a beautiful place to live. So, you know, I think, you know, from the difference of, you know, obviously from some of the other markets, from other, other people that have come on out here, you know, the market is it's from its peak to its trough. We had 11% decline um, in single family homes. Um, but we've seen that we've already started to recover and year over year, we're only down 2.3%. Um, so I think that's very unique to Hawaii. I know in, you know, like, um, Josh, who was just on in Boise, I know that they've taken a large hit because that had a huge boom and, you know, naturally with the huge boom, we see a bust and in each market, it's somewhat different, but because I think Hawaii is so unique specifically, I think because of the military, because they're never stopped coming here, right. It's a strategic location to be, um, they buy up a lot of homes and we've seen that. Although the market has uh, come down a bit, it has already started to recover. Um, so, you know, we have seen when it comes to new home builds, similar to what you're seeing across the nation, um, you know, 12 months ago, they would release, let's say, eight homes in this uh, one development they call Ho'opili. And there would be, literally be a line out the door. It would be on a lottery system. And there would be on average 150 applicants and only eight people would get selected right and it would just be nuts now fast forward to where we are now 
they're now offering anywhere from six thousand to twelve thousand dollars in credit for the buyer um, they're also offering special rates generally they're buying up loans in bulk and then reselling them um, at about six and a half to uh, five and a half for va um, and it's a first come first serve so you go from there being you know 120 applicants to them having inventory that's sitting there and they're they're paying you to buy the home right so that's one market that we're seeing specifically where you know, we have seen, you know, properties that are not turnkey or not flying off the shelves, but the average days on market right now are, you know, still pretty fast compared to the rest of the nation where our average days on market is 21 days for single family homes and uh, 25 days for condos. They were taking applications, a hundred, 150 applications. How were they qualifying these people? Like they were breathing, they could, you know, uh, write a check. They could, I mean, how do you qualify somebody to buy? I mean, you take a hundred applications. How were they qualifying? These so it was similar. It was similar like to like when you, it was similar to like when you put an offer in for a property. So you could not even submit an application unless you had a pre-approval letter. So unless you were pre-approved with either their in-house lender or with an, an outside lender, um, they wouldn't even consider you, you know, and there it's like 150 applicants. You probably had more than that. They were interested, but if they weren't approved, then they wouldn't even get through the door. Yeah, I was going to say, sounds like maybe some fair housing violations if they're, you know, uh, you know, how are they qualifying people? I mean, I would be curious to that. Uh, I'm just going to, Todd, excuse me just for one moment, because we do have a question here for Patrick that just popped up. And I'd like you to have an opportunity, Patrick, to answer this. Patrick, what is the average price of a single family home? Okay, everybody hold their breath. Here we go. So um, right now it's at for a single family home, the median sales price is a million fifty. Okay. Um, that is the median, um, at its peak, which was, uh, back in about, I think it was March. It was at a million one, two, five. Um, and we've seen it bottom out at a million dollars and it's already started to recover back at a million 50. That's where it's at right now for a single family. Home. All right. So, 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 so come on, man, we got to, that, 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 this is like, this doesn't make sense to me. Look, I love our military. You know, um, my father was in the, served in the army. Uh, I have two uncles, one in the army, one of the Marines. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I think the world of our armed forces were paying them though. I would think, you know, the amount of money that would, they wouldn't be able to afford a million dollar mortgage payment. I mean, this, what am I missing here? What am I missing? Yeah, no, here? you're, you're I mean, we're looking right. at 10,000, $12,000 a month. In a, in so, a mortgage payment? No way. Yeah. So so that's the median for a single family home. So a lot of the military members that I work with, um, a lot of them, you know, they usually find themselves in a townhome or a condo. Um, I have a couple unique, you know, higher officers who do uh, have been in the military long enough where they have a high enough rank and high enough pay and high enough what we call BAH, basic allowance of housing, where they get actual cash from the government tax free for housing. You combine that all together and at some times they uh, actually can purchase, you know, I've done, I'm doing one right now for 1.5. I did one um, a couple months ago for a million, but generally most of the time my military uh, clients or anybody in the military who's purchasing with the VA loan is generally anywhere between 300 and 700. Patrick, what were these yeah. houses selling for in 2019? That's a great question. I can actually tell you right now because I got the data right here. So in 2019, the, uh, are you ready for it? So the median sales price for a single family home back in 2019 was $782,000. Well, I have a feeling you may be getting back to that. I, th we could see, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people have said, um, I think the main thing specific, cause I'm just saying Hawaii is a very unique market, right? And the military is not the only people purchasing. I heard you're right? overcrowded. I heard that it's nothing like it used to be. Right. I, I mean, I know people that live in, I, I don't know what Island they are, but they're friends with family and uh, they're talking about leaving because they're like, man, this is, it's so overcrowded. It's not even, you know, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's there's a lot of people and it's and it's expensive, right? So you naturally will see um, a movement of people um, either moving to other islands that are uh, more affordable. We have a large population that moves to Vegas for whatever reason, um, 
And, uh, and yeah, I think the biggest issue we're seeing, at least in regards to what's propping up prices, and I'm sure you've heard this over and over again, is that we just don't have any inventory. And then you put that on an island, right? There's, there's no space for us to even build more, even if, even if the developers wanted to build more, right? So um, you combine that too. And other than the military, who do these people work for? Other than the military, who do these people work for? What do you mean exactly by that? Like who I mean, else who is are providing jobs? I mean, who's keeping people? Yeah. Employed? yeah. I uh, mean, I think of Hawaii, like, I, 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 and I'm not, I'm thinking like vacation, you know, like resorts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, hospitality. I mean, is there a big hospitality industry? Yeah. So that's, that's the main, you know, business export, right? It's going to be hospitality and then everything that supports that. Um, but just like anything, yeah. just like anywhere, you've got jobs in every single industry that you could possibly think of. Obviously, we're not like, you know, San Francisco, L.A. or, you know, New York in the sense where it's like a financial district or hub or tech hub or things like that. But, you know, it is yeah. part of the United States. Um, some people might not know that. Um, and, it, you know, we have, I would say, our major export or our major um, job creator would obviously be anything in the hospitality but it's a, it's a major hub out here in regards to work. You know, I mean, there's, there's work to be had, um, not a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and, and there is a significant difference in, you know, the cost of living and what the median, uh, median salary is for a family, right? Um, low I think, income uh, I think is uh, basically anything hurricanes. under 100. Hurricanes. Yeah. Think, so I we think generally... hurricanes, I'm thinking fires, I'm thinking, you know, like insurance cancellations. I mean, what is happening with insurance companies and, you know, being able to afford insurance on a million dollar home? Yeah. Great question. So we have seen insurance premiums go up, which I'm sure you guys have probably seen in, in a lot of similar places with similar climates like yeah. Florida. I've heard some horror stories of what's going on over there. We've seen, um, you know, in a lot of condos, They'd have their own, you know, hurricane insurance and things like that, um, or flood insurance. All of those premiums have gone up, right? Anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, which is significant, um, especially for people who are already stretching with their with their payment, right? Um, so that is something that has come up and something that is concerned. Obviously, property taxes as well. We've seen property taxes increase. Um, although Hawaii does have some of the lowest property taxes in the nation, um, which you know, is pretty much the only thing that's cheap out here. Um, they have started to increase uh, slightly, which, you know, especially for the investors, it's really hit them hard. It's gone up significantly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. We do All have right, a super well, chat. Some question. I'm yeah. Just gonna, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and Tim Langer, I know that you had a question for Hawaii, but these are going by super fast. So if you could just chat that again, I promise I'll get to it. I just, we got a lot, we got a lot of Hawaii questions. I'm sure there's, a, there's just a <laughs> lot of people that are like, this is crazy. This is insane. It's so freaking expensive. It's, it's... Okay. So we have a super chat question here is a $300,000 increase in under four years, typical in Hawaii. Um, it's not out of the ordinary. You know, on average, we see uh, four to six, four to ten percent appreciation. Once again, because there's no inventory, because you have multiple markets they're interested in, you just have this high, high um, demand for property, and there just simply isn't any. Um, and it really comes down to the price point, right? So again, if you take that average four to ten percent, I would say four to six percent over thirty years of data, we've seen an average appreciation. Um, in the last boom, we saw anywhere for the condo market, we saw about twelve to fifteen percent. For single family homes, we saw a twenty-seven percent increase. But again that was a very special time, good or bad, whatever you want to label it, where we saw this huge boost. But I've seen multiple properties where people will buy it for call it a million two, which sounds like a lot of money, but there's like in my neighborhood, a million two barely gets you uh, uh, like the house is still a sugar shack and they'll renovate it for a hundred grand and then they'll sell it for a million, 1.5, 1.6 all day. Right. Um, because people right now in this what, market, what happened? Yeah, what ahead. happened in 2008? What happened in the GFC to Hawaii? Yeah, so I'll bring up. Um, I'm going to look at this right now. So you'd like to you'd like to know in 2000. I, I want to know. I want to know how insulated you guys are from reality of uh, a financial. <laughs> Did you live crisis. in a dream world out here? Um, yeah, yeah. So in 2008, like it. show to the people in DC, but um, yeah. you know the surrounding areas were decimated in uh you know in in price drops i mean we have some of the most i mean you talk about military i mean maryland i mean we have tons 
of you know government employees, military, uh, you know big bases. We have NSA, um, you know uh, NASA. Uh, I, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I mean, the sur- think the areas that surround DC. Um, I mean, you know, boy, Maryland was destroyed. It took from 2006, the peak of 2006, to the peak of 2022 uh, in order. Well, actually, I could even, I could argue into 2023 in some markets for the, b- before these people could sell their house for what they paid for in 2006. Right. And they still brought money to the table because they improved their home and that amount of time, I mean, 10 years, 15 years, you're spending money on your house, man. Or it's really depreciating because you're not keeping up on it. So you figure these people that paid in Maryland, I mean, we have some of the highest median income earners in the country. So what happened in 08? So in 2008, from 2007 to 2008, um, March to March here, I'm just going to pick that from the peak to the trough. Uh, the median sales price for a single family home, it was 665 in 2007. And in 2008, where the trough uh, basically hits the bottom, uh, it was 612. So it wasn't really that significant. Well, take me back to 2005 or 2006, not 2007, because we already started seeing the tumbling prices by then. So take me back to 2006. Okay. Let's take a look um, at that. Yeah, if you guys like, I could share my screen, but I don't know if that's going to complicate things, or I could just throw the. Well, just tell, us, just tell us. Just okay. tell us. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just don't think you're, you're going to believe me. <laughs> so, um, we didn't see too I much of an you. adjustment. Yeah, we didn't see too much of an adjustment. So, I'm looking at let's call it March of 2006. Uh, the market kind of flattened out in June of 2006. It popped up, so we went. Wait a minute, just yeah, just tell me what the price is. What was the median price? Six twenty-five. March June. 2006, six twenty-five. June of 2006, 650. So it went up. And then, 650. Um, there we go. June, that's a big month. 650. Yes. And what was the trough in 2000? And well, 2008. So the bottom, the, what the happened? bottom would be 612. So okay. again, it's, I think the biggest difference, and this is so specific to Hawaii. So it's so hard to say. You, you said know, every 650 year. and 612. Correct. Mm-hmm. Right. That was your single family. And you said the bottom in 08, does it get worse in 2009 or 10? It doesn't. It really doesn't. That was literally the the cheapest. uh, Or actually, it it popped up again to 665, and then it went back down to 612. So it's just a very very unique market out here. And it's specifically because we have so many different people who want to buy Hawaii. You have one market that falls out. You have three other they are going to fill their spot, right? Yeah. So, well, I mean, it's you definitely are in a unique uh, sort of bubble in your own little bubble. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll see. I mean, I definitely want to keep tabs. Hey, look, I, you know, I hope it is roses and sunshine for everybody. You know, I don't want to, uh, you know, people think I like to report or talk about things that seem like doom and gloom. I, you know, I just, I I think that being realistic is more, you know, I talk to people that are every single day that are struggling to, um, you know, and they have great jobs, but they still can't save any money. And, you know, I, I think this is a large percentage of Americans and they feel like they're being kicked down and they're, they make too much money to get a lot of these, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, grants and uh, special financing and these different types of government, uh, you know, offerings. So they make too much money for that, but yet they they can't buy a house because they can't save any money. It's hard for them to live. I don't think it's unique to Maryland. I mean, people reach out to us all over the country and, you know, book calls with us. They send us emails and you can book a call with us right on the website. You can go to the website. You can do it right now. You can book a call with, with me. You can book a call 
with Melissa. You can calls. go on the website right now. Schedule a call. <laughs> you can schedule a call. It happens. People do it all the time. I get the alerts that pop does. up. You don't. Know, you, yeah. you, you, you can. You can do it right Melissa's now. Pop up on my phone. Okay. Well, my, my day not, tomorrow is going to be filled calls. with calls. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. We're not. We're not BSing here. I mean, this is we're a real company. We actually mm -hmm. help people buy and sell. Uh, you know, we have agents all over the country, like Patrick um, in Hawaii, that you know um, are very qualified to help you. If you need an agent in your area, and you're one of those that are you know struggling to buy, and you're hopeful, and you want to get on some kind of a good track or some kind of a plan, you want to talk to somebody that can give good reasoning. And, you know, if you feel like that one of these agents that are on our site, it's growing every day, aren't, uh, you know, doing what uh, they should be doing. And you're going to report back to us and we're going to follow up on it and see what's going on. Because, you know, uh, we want you to have great representation. You know, these things with the lawsuits that are out there right now, I think this is a miss. This is really being misguided. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, the attorneys now have their their claws into these cases. The copycat cases are breaking out everywhere. And I think in the long run, I don't know that it's going to be good for the buyers or the sellers. You know, you have the DOJ that is, so right now they're trying to come up with these settlements with the MLS and the brokerages. And they're trying to figure out, you know, how, how do they do this? Because for years, the seller has been paying the listing broker. The listing broker takes a percentage of that what the listing broker gets and they offer it up to a buyer broker on the other side. And now they're saying that that's price fixing and, you know, controlling the market and things like that. And a lot of people that are pissed off because home prices are so high. Never before has this come into argument. We drop the interest rates to zero, give everybody a bunch of forbearance and bailouts, let home prices get to the point to where no one can afford them unless you're rich. And now all of a sudden they're surprised that they want to, go after everybody they should really be looking at you know why did this happen in the first place but here's the thing so now the doj what they want to do so the new proposed let you know uh solution here is that they want to say okay as a some of the mls's and associations are coming up with this they're saying look how about this how about we say to the seller our fee to sell your house X amount of dollars. Do you want to offer the buyer's agent something? And if so, what do you want to offer them? Commissions are always negotiable. But the DOJ is saying, well, wait a minute. That's not even right. Because the broker, the listing broker is still controlling that. Controlling that price or whatever that that's not free market what they're really getting at here in my opinion guys is they want buyers to pay for their own agents i think that's what we're getting at as we push this that's the only way to to completely make it free market if you don't want to have the seller you know right off the bat say i'll pay x amount of dollars or whatever for your agent mr mrs buyer you don't want to do that then you're going to have to say the seller pays their agent, the buyer pays their agent, have a nice day and decide whether you can afford it, whether you want it, what the free market should reign, what the fees will be, whatever that case is, there won't be any fixing of not anything, right? If there is any fixing going on, right? I, I like to think at it is the buyers and sellers have looked at the contracts, at least, they should be looking at the contract and understanding what they signed. But I get it. A lot of the brokerages or agents weren't being forthright. They were telling the buyers that they're free and they weren't free at all. That's the big problem that I have. They didn't have the guts to negotiate with their buyers. They knew that they were getting paid by the, whatever the MLS was offering. So instead of having even a conversation with their buyers, as to commission at all, they were just saying, oh, you don't have to pay it. It's free. The seller pays it, which is now you're starting to get into what I believe wasn't right for if you were doing that as an agent, that's bad practice because in fact, 
when the buyer got to the settlement table, looked at the settlement sheet and said, oh my gosh, you made, how much? You made $15,000? Man, I had to scrape every penny that I put together. You made, you made, whoa, I thought you were free. Well, you know, no, the seller paid my, the seller's broker paid the commission. Yeah, but guess what? That's where the buyers are saying, but hey, I ultimately, nobody got paid if I didn't pay, if I didn't pay the price. So this is where a lot of these arguments are getting into a lot of valid points that are being brought up. But what I don't want to see happen out of all this, I want to see all of the agents that shouldn't be in this business find another job. If you don't want to come to the office, you don't want to come to sales meetings, you don't want to talk to your broker or your manager and get advice, you want to do whatever the hell you want to do, fill out how the forms improperly because you're too ignorant to learn them. You want to complain that you have, you know, a few hours a year of CE and, you know, cram them in and eat your potato chips in class and annoy everybody else, you know, this is what, guys, if you're in the business, you know what I'm talking about. You know these people that don't want to answer the phones, that don't want to call you back. Hell, I, I showed a house a month ago. I still haven't heard back from the agent. And I left two messages. My buyer didn't want it anyway, but they did. We were talking about it. These people, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Find another job. But let's not... Let's not take this and make this bad for the consumers either, right? Let's let's think about this for a minute because people are entitled to representation. And let me tell you something. There are people out there that do a great job and they're worth every penny that's being paid, whatever that is. But I don't want to see us going down this, this road well, look, we made this way too easy for people to get in this business. You can't do anything else, become a real estate agent. And if you're listening and this offends you, then that shoe fits, right? If it doesn't fit, you're going to say, you know what? He's exactly right. We need to tighten this up because this is the single largest expense that anybody does in their life if they're not in business, right? Maybe they buy an airplane. I mean, what's more expensive than a, a house for a million dollars or $500,000? You're not buying a half a million dollar house and a half a million dollar car. Right? So we, we, we do need to clean, we need to clean this up. Patrick, do you agree? Yeah, no, I do agree. Uh, there's a very low barrier to entry to become a realtor. I mean, you literally just pass a, a hundred question tests um, and then you're in and they usually just kick you on the butt. Any brokerage will take you and say, yeah, tell all your friends and family that you're a realtor and then figure it out. Right. Um, so I 100 percent agree. You know, I think that there should be at least some better pre-qualifying for people. I mean, you, you are to a certain extent, at least if you're a good lawyer and you're actually reading contracts and guiding your clients accordingly and explaining them to the contracts, you're almost like a lawyer to a certain extent, but it's just insane how much a lawyer actually has to do to you know learn about contracts and, and be able to deal with clients and have to pass the bar and, and do all of this training. And then for a realtor, you literally can go to a six to eight week course, pass a test, and then boom, you can sell a million dollar, five million dollar, whatever million dollar house. Um, and I think that's also why that there's a high failure rate. A lot of people think that they can get licensed and then, you know, get into the business and make millions of dollars and make a bunch of money, get a fat commission check. But the reality is, is if you don't know how to run your own business, no one's going to help you. And, uh, if you're not actually learn, like trying to learn how to be a good business owner and a good realtor, then, you know, that's why one out of four realtors are still a realtor after two years. There's like a massive failure, failure rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we agree, Patrick. All right, man. Well, we appreciate you checking in from uh, Hawaii. Anytime. We'll, we'll move right along. We'll we'll bring Thanks, uh, we'll bring Philip in. Philip, he's a ball of fire, man. I know Philip and I did a video together. It hit I don't know four hundred thousand views, something nuts. Phil, what's going on, brother? Hi, Phil. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Guys, that's the only time. 
yeah. that you won't hear from Phil the rest of the night. <laughs> Good to see you, brother. Why don't you tell everybody who you are? You're a real estate broker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Philip Simonetta, broker owner, Pier 21 Realty here in Florida, licensed in Florida, North Carolina, and Tennessee. Also the owner of the Florida Real Estate School by Pier 21 Realty. So we uh, teach 31 courses, 63-hour pre-licensing, post-licensing, um, continuing ed. We educate the agents to become brokers as well with the 72-hour course. Uh, it's myself. It's family-owned and operated. My son, Aiden, and I, he's a broker and instructor as well. Um, and basically, that's who we are. That's what we do. And um, it's good to be here. It's good to have you. Well, before we get your opinion on the market let's finalize how i think 2008 will be like 2025 because now we've kind of taken it all the way full circle i think that um i'm not i'm very you know uh you know i'm very bearish on yeah. the market i think uh you know i think that we've seen like i said the affordability when i hear these people say the housing market's only going to go up uh, we know that investors can't, you know, participate at this price uh, because the rents don't pencil out. They don't make sense. We know that a lot of people, uh, Lenar, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're in the news right now, you know, liquidating multifamily. You see them building uh, tiny you know, homes. Uh, they're building tiny properties. homes now, too. <laughs> yeah. So here's the thing. We're, we're not going to make houses affordable. We're going to stick you in a tiny home. Yeah. How about it, man? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, one, one of the right, things so I'm let's, dealing let's with. Pull up this. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And I'll let you know what's no, going on. No, go ahead. I was, we're going to pull up this article yeah. here and uh, yeah. talk about 2008. Sure. Well, here we go. Published by the Baltimore Sun, by New York Times News Service. Home sales declined sharply last month, and housing prices posted posted their deepest declines in four decades as a rapidly slowing economy discouraged many potential buyers from tiptoeing into the market. This is 2008, guys. Wait till sales of existing numbers. homes declined. Yep. Wait till I give sales you, of wait existing homes numbers. declined 8.6% last month to a seasonably adjusted rate of 4.49 million, according to the National Association of Realtors. The median price of a home fell 13% in November. And that was the lowest price since February of 2004. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say the troubles in the housing market, which are the at the heart of America's financial crisis, are only multiplying as the broader economy deteriorates. And then I want to just go down a little mm -hmm. bit further. Still, some economists said that the home prices will have to fall even further before they dip low enough to entice, all, to, to entice potential home buyers. And then Lawrence Yoon, who I've also podcasted with on our channel, mm -hmm. you can just go to our real estate, our Saks Realty YouTube channel and just search Lawrence Yoon or NAR, you'll find it. Lawrence Yoon, chief economist of the National Association of Realtors, said that 45% of all home sales were so-called distressed sales, meaning that sellers faced foreclosures or they were forced to sell their home for less than the value of the mortgage. Now, what I want to say here is now we're fast forwarding this to my opinion, 2025. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many bailouts you do for uh, failing mortgage payers, whatever their hardship is, unless you're also going to fix the home, go in and repair the home, put new roofs on the home, put new heating and air systems in the home, you know, update the homes, uh, things that are breaking, you're not going to stop the deterioration. Mm -hmm. So though we may not see the foreclosures because of the propped up situation we're in right now, if we advance this another two years, the people that have to have been bailed out or that have had modifications or forbearances, if a large, large percentage of these homeowners 
aren't fixing things, we're going to see a massive amount, maybe another 50% of the home sales being mm -hmm. distressed. Go ahead. Yeah. Phil. It, it, it's good. People are going to be destroyed. Um, it's 10 times worse than what 08 was. I don't care what anybody's saying. The, these analysts and these politicians, both parties, you know, they're, they have no clue what they're doing. It's like they're the kids that got picked on in high school and they're getting back at the world. You know, um, it's frustrating. And, and I'll tell you, in my market, now I'm in the entire state of Florida. I have, example, I have a, a eight acre piece of agricultural land for sale in Orlando. I have a home for sale in the villages, which is a retirement community. I have a couple of fixer upper homes here in Jacksonville. I have a $1.1 million home outside of Gainesville. So I have different markets and different things that I'm working in with my agents. I got to tell you, I've had no, no showings in the last three weeks. I've dropped prices twice and we're under market, under where appraisals are and the RPR reports and, and things. The only offers I'm getting are from wholesalers and investors that are just sending me emails what they want to offer at 10 to 40 percent under the market. That's all I'm getting. Sellers are frustrated. I'm talking. I, I mean, I, I communicate with them. I tell them what's going on. And, you know, I have one seller. He disappeared. I can't find him. <laughs> I don't know where the guy is. But but um, um, it's just it, it's why it's aren't crazy. you? Why aren't we hearing that in the news? Why 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 are they suppressing this information? I don't know. And, um, and, and, and this is realistic. And, and I'm going to go over some numbers with you. I'm in a bunch of MLSs down here, but the largest MLS is, is the Orlando regional, which is stellar. That goes from, uh, it goes from Daytona beach over to Tampa down to Cape Coral. So it's kind of like the whole center of the state. It's not the most expensive, but it's the, it's the largest area. And, um, when I, when I go over these numbers with you, it's, it's going to blow you away. Just the last seven days, what's going on. And the public doesn't see those numbers until a month from now. So, so what's happening before you do, before you do, yeah. let me just stop you one second. Yeah. Let's look at the poll because I mm -hmm. think this is going to apply. Yeah. We just had a poll out there, Joe, if you can pull up the results, we were asking, do you think there's going to be a hard crash, a, a recession, mild recession, or do you think a soft landing? And Philip, I want, as you get into this, let's look at this. So, 60%, 761 votes. You guys can go to the poll. You can vote now if you haven't already done so. Uh, we could see what, what you know, if this stays to this type of, uh, you know, outcome, what you think is going to happen. Hard landings, number one. People aren't, they're not going for the bullshit. Two thirds. Right? I mean, you know, they're, 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 people are, you know, look, 766 votes, 60%. 87% say we're going to have a recession. 87%. Yeah. I believe in, look, I'd rather listen to my audience. We're okay? in it, man. There's nothing I would to rather we're listen to, Yeah. I would rather listen to my audience and what you guys, I have probably one of the, the highest intellects in my, you know, my audience, very mm -hmm. smart people. Yeah. And they're watching the markets. A lot of these aren't buyers or sellers. These are people that know the amount of GDP that is involved in the housing sector and the, you know, the basket of goods. These people are watching markets play out, right? Yeah. Here you go. 60, 87% believe in a recession, 13% soft landing. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah. yeah. Tell us I mean, what's happening. Let, let me go over these numbers with you quick. And then I want to say something about the industry and what's happening with the agents and, and, and the bigger brokers with these lawsuits. But um, let me just go over these numbers really quick. So just, just in the last seven days, and you got to figure this is the last seven days we're between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, and we have new listings that went on the market. 8,036 price decreases, 7,967. Back on the market, contracts that were canceled, 1,957, seven days. Expired listings, 886. Temporary off the market, people just sick and tired of saying, hold on, let's just take a break here. 765. Withdrawn, just people who given up and withdrew the sale, 768. And canceled, just people who canceled, kind of like withdrawn, but canceled them so they could relist with other people or whatever. You're talking 1,445. That adds up to in one week, 13,857 properties 
hit the market, either new or fell back onto it or left. And that's just in one MLS. That's not counting beaches, which is, you know, St. Lucie, Palm Beach, uh, Broward, and Dade, which is a very big area. And that's not counting the Naples MLS. That's not counting the Jacksonville and, and the Tallahassee. And I mean, you. this is just a, a good chunk of the center of the state. And I'm telling you, I'm not getting, I, I'm, I've never, even in 07, 08, I've had action. Now, I'm a little bit different than most agents and brokers, you know, having the school, the brokerage, I, I'm invested in different businesses. I drum up business. I mean, I, I'm pulling listings, I'm, I'm getting things up, but I'm telling people straight out, you know, where we are, what's happening, what we're looking at. I have, there's no buyers. There's no buyers, man. And I don't know where these mortgage applications are. They're talking mortgage applications <laughs> are up and who's refinancing? Who's buying? Nobody's buying anything. I'll tell you who's I refinancing. No. You want to no. know who's refinancing? Because we've had a, a mortgage loan officer brag about it. I'll tell you who's refinancing. People that have credit card debt that is mm -hmm. outrageous yeah. and a little bit of equity yeah. in their home. And it's they're crazy. selling themselves completely upriver, right? Downriver, right? With the uh -huh. fact that, you know, they're, and they're like, yay, I just helped somebody, you know, they refinance $40,000 yeah. in high cost credit card debt. Well, they help guess themselves. What? <laughs> you just now took them from a 3% or 4% mortgage into a 7% or 7.5% mortgage. Yeah. And you just put them in a situation where their credit cards are going to be paid over the next Listen. 30 years and yeah. they have their credit cards freed back up like their situations changed. You know what you they're going to do? You they're going to start this. charging again. They're going to start gotta, charging again. Yeah. It's ridiculous. You got, you got to listen Shouldn't to this. You even one. be allowed. They think they helped them. If they really wanted to help them, they would have left their 4% mortgage alone and did a home equity line and paid off the credit cards. They didn't help them. They helped their own pocket, man. They're a bunch of clowns. You know, that, that's predatory lending, if you ask me. But anyway, um, what I'm working on now, I, I'm, I'm looking for sellers with FHA and VA mortgages. And I'll give you why. an example why. They're both assumable. I have a, a, a deal now. Woman's moving from Florida to Georgia. Um, it's, a, it's a VA loan. Now, she had it listed twice with agents before me. One agent advertised there was no HOA or no CDD or no. Okay, none of them talked about a VA, a VA mortgage. Okay, so I advertise it. The first line in the listing, you can look it up online. It's on, it's on Zillow, wherever you want to look. It's 10191 Bangle Fox Drive in Jacksonville. The line that opens it up, this home has a 2.99 assumable VA mortgage. You do not need to be a veteran to assume it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've had 26 calls on it. But you need to make up the it. difference. You need to yeah, make oh. up the difference from the loan yeah. amount yeah, and yeah. the asking yeah. price. No, and a lot listen. of people don't have the cash. No, no, we're in Florida. You have, people have the cash. You know, the people are moving here. I have another vet who's retired coming down here. They're putting a hundred grand down, taking over the mortgage at $307,000 at 2.99%. That same deal, if he would have came and put hundred grand and did it at today's rate, it was $1,136 more a month, same house. So the key But why is, are they throwing the hundred? If, if you're telling me that the home prices are dropping he wants it's going to be a massive fallout, why no. would he be throwing $100,000 away? He may be back because, to the original purchase price and be able to assume the loan flat out. The investment, the investment is the mortgage, not the house. The investment is the mortgage. He's getting a 2.99% mortgage on $306,000. Even if the house comes down, he's still, what his payment is, you can't even rent a three bedroom, two bed, two bath. Yeah, but how much does it, $100,000? I mean, you have to be there yeah. forever. You got to be there for a long time. If there's going to be massive think... price corrections, I mean, yeah. $100,000 in cash or 50,000, if you lose mm -hmm. that money, yeah. that pays a lot of difference in mortgage prices over yeah. many, 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 many years. So if but you can get a 6%, 6.5% loan or a 4% loan, mm -hmm. two and a half points on $300,000 or $400,000, mm -hmm. if you're going to lose 50 grand, 70 grand, $100,000 of your money, you yeah. may as well just negotiate hard on a property and pay the extra. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it coming down that much. I mean, Maybe 20, 30%, you know, maybe, maybe 30, You just 40, told 10. me some pretty scary numbers. 
No, no, I know, I know. But this this thirty percent on a three hundred or four hundred thousand dollar loan is over a hundred thousand dollars, my friend. Yeah. No, no. But what I'm saying is, in the there's certain communities, people are still going to demand. There's still going to be a, a demand for them. They're going to drop. There's no doubt about it. But there's you know the, there's certain areas. These gated communities here. There's a demand for them. They're going to drop. Even even in 08, they dropped. There is a drop coming. I mean, there's there, there's some significant in Florida in 08. It's an I could buy market. a two-bedroom condominium in Florida mm-hmm. for thirty-five thousand yeah. dollars, yeah. man. They're still, they're still right? there, and they would give me a BMW. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, they're still there. There, I mean, there, there's certain things that are still there, but there's going to be certain buildings. I'll give you an example. You know, the building Sea Ranch. It's a uh, forty-nine hundred North Ocean Boulevard in uh, Lauderdale by the Sea. You know, I had a buyer. Um, they're they're million-dollar condos. It's right on the ocean. Beautiful building. I mean, it's like a resort. Three pools and. I mean, you, you can look it up online. Just look up Sea Ranch, Building C. Um, and the southeast corner, uh, 11th floor went on sale. Uh, we offered them 1.2. Somebody from Australia came in and paid 1.8. It's only worth 950, maybe a million. But my people wanted it so bad. They're bu- they were buying it for their family forever. And they were willing to step up because they were asking more for it. I mean, it's yeah, well, a southeast that's a corner. unique property. I but mean, but I'm saying yeah, I mean, there's a lot a, of that. Yeah. There's a lot of that though. There's a lot of that. Like yeah, these tell it to somebody in Sarasota. Tell no, it to somebody no, no, forget it. You in can't. you know. Yeah, I mean, it's you, you know, it's not you, you got reality. Uh, but before I mean, look, we get off of here, Philip, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's your what's your government doing about? I mean, you're. It looks like your house housing market is falling apart at the seams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it so is. What, what's what, what's happening from an administrative side? Yeah. Why I mean, is that happening? Why you guys yeah. are the hottest on domestic migration, domestic migration. You were the hottest Still is. The, I mean, since there's, 2020. There's people moving here. They're just so renting. why what, what you said, but nobody's buying. So what's nobody's going buying. on? I don't know. I, I can't put my finger on it. I think people are tapped out. I don't think they have the money. Price. The debt rate, the debt ratios. They don't have the debt ratios. They don't have the income yeah, to support the, the debt money. ratios. They don't have the 36%, the 41% or for, you know, the FHAs that they don't have the money. They're not making enough. And they're dead. The problem with Florida is you don't have the jobs. No, and you're right. You have no jobs. You have no jobs. It's all service. Yeah. They, they out, they shipped out everything. It's service and it's a lot of agriculture, you know, down South. You're one hurt. You're one hurricane away, unfortunately from, I mean, a massive, you know, in my opinion, you know, I mean, it's, I, I look, I know a lot of people that packed up and moved to Florida and I'm not knocking it, man. You know, we've talked, I know about a lot of people before. that are moving out. I know a lot of people that yeah. just had enough, you know, they're going to Tennessee. That's, that's one of the reasons I got the license in Tennessee. You know, we just closed that house. Yeah. I told you guys about it. I got, I actually got my license in Tennessee because my seller was buying a house in Tennessee. So I remember I told you, I went and got the license to do that deal. Now, now yeah. I'm working with some other deals there, but, um, yeah, you know, it, uh, Georgia, the one I'm selling now is moving to Georgia. They had enough hit. You know, it's 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 what's happening. People are getting out of here because the insurance is doubling, tripling. The taxes are going up. Or being know, canceled there's a lo- altogether. It, it, it's changing. There's a lot of changes happening. Yeah? You know, and and industry wise, you know, just want to take a second, like what you're saying about the the agents in the industry. You know, with all these lawsuits, they just filed a lawsuit now in Florida. It's not the Sherman Act though. They're using another act from 1980. It's a newer version of an antitrust. And they're going after smaller companies, Charles Ruttenberg, LPT, um, all these newer companies, companies that I personally know the owners and brokers of. And they're they coming after all them. I think I sent you over the, uh, I, put, I posted on the page that we have, um, but they're coming after them now. And now they're talking about going after individual agents for, for back for commissions. And so, so what I'm doing, I put together, my whole apprenticeship, you know that. My, I mean, I, I teach listings, I teach REOs, I teach foreclosures. I'll do well. My agents are going to do well during all this because we're going to just go in the back end where other agents quit and leave. That leaves no, there's no competition for the backside. Are of you going to get named in the lawsuit? Hey, let them, you know, let, they, they can sue me. I, let, let them, let them, you know, I'll, I'll represent myself. And when it's all done, I'll file bankruptcy, man. <laughs> I don't oh, care. God. They're not going to beat me, man. I, I'll beat them with a stick. All of them. I'll laugh at them. You know, I'm serious. I mean, what are you going to do? There, there's laws. All right. Anybody that's you. done business with Pierce. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, though. Todd, you think about it. You think about it, buddy. What they're doing to people is criminal. What they're doing with these lawsuits. I, I don't, law, you know, I don't know, man. Criminal, I, I man. tell you. And look, I, I don't mean to look. I don't, I don't, you know, look, this industry has needed a correction 
for a very long time. I, agree. I mean, Melissa, but this is Melissa will tell you a hundred percent. I mean, it's, you know, one, one, one of the, I mean, one of the things that we talk about on a regular basis is frustration, you know, and, yeah. and a lot of it's it painful. is from, it's painful yeah. from the brokers yeah. down to the agents, no, I, I agree. you know, the supervision. Let me tell you what happened. And I've said it before on my channel. We put the buyer or the seller, we sold them out. Yeah. Right. Before back in the day, the real estate industry, the brokers used to be involved. Mm -hmm. They managed their agents. They were I, involved. Yeah, I do what they I did. Every deal. I meet them. I work, what, I work with what every they, deal. what they did, and I'm talking about the industry at large, yeah. was they made the agent the client, the customer. They catered mm -hmm. to them. They if they fogged a mirror. And they brought them in. They could get fees out of them. They could charge them training programs. A lot of these brokers, yeah. they, um, you know, they, they set up, too. Them too. They, they set up uh, mortgage companies. They set up title companies to where their That's main the money. money maker wasn't even mm -hmm. the brokerage at all. Right. They didn't manage these people and they ran a muck. And what happens when you do when look, when you let, you know, the, uh, you let the rooster out of the hen house, man. You, you, you now have opened it up to the wild west that yeah. they did whatever the heck they wanted. Well, even to do. the regulation, and even as a result, man, they don't enforce them. Think about NAR that is quantity over quality. You have, you know, so you think about how they make their money is quantity. In an association, it's the quantity of people paying into the association. It's yeah. not the quality of the people that belong to the association. It's the quantity, right? So the any, whole thing from the, from the, they from the touch freaking, you know, head down, you know, yeah. it, it needed, it needed, it needed correction. And guess what? We're going to get it. Yeah. Oh, it's coming. You may not it's like coming. what we're going to get, but it's coming. It's coming. And yeah. there's going to be, you know, a reckoning in this industry and, you know, we'll see what happens, but, you yeah. know, I just hope that the consumers don't ultimately pay the price. You know, the I thing, think the that, thing that I'm uh, doing, you know, the thing that I'm doing is I, you know, I put together this apprenticeship and what I'm doing, I'm actually starting now, like literally I'm sending the first emails out tomorrow. I'm going to put producers. I'm going to top producers. I'm telling them who I am, what I do, why I do it, what it's about. And, you know, these big brokerages are getting sued, okay? The smaller brokerages, we're safe right now, right? They're, we don't have enough volume. We don't have enough, you know, we're not making billions. Well, what about the fact that some of these top producers are the reason the brokers are getting sued? Right. Well, well, that's true. That's true. But the thing is, I'm going to-, to the I say, producers. have a nice day. I start training people from scratch. And I'm going to start that. Well, that's true too. That That's the other angle. You know? The problem is who's- Who's you can take your arrogance of your top producing mm -hmm. years yeah. and all your cockiness and yeah. you, yeah. I owe you everything because yeah. you're holier yeah. and you know, you bring in all this revenue. Well, guess what? We'll see how much you bring in now. And I think the teams, I, don't, I want I to think, stand I think as the far away from a lot, a lot of these people, too. you know, having right. these teams of people, everybody's out there doing these things and nobody's regulating these people and they're coming and going, coming and going. And there's like 50 agents that are one person and there's no, like none of them know what they're doing. And I mean, it's, yeah. it's like, they're it's held like at speaking bay. to the choir. The brokers now, they're stuck. So yeah. You know, they were talking, time. Florida was talking, I was watching the, um, the, every, every month they have the hearings online. You can watch them. So I usually put them on the big TV here in the office and I kind of let it go while I'm doing stuff. You know, the thing is, I can't believe some of the people that are letting get licensed. People who committed securities frauds 10 years ago. Somebody who was in jail for aggravated assault. They gave five years ago. They're, they're, a girl stole from Walmart two years ago. The girl stole from Walmart and they give her a real estate license. They, they had a hearing. They gave her, what, what, if this girl has a bad day, she's showing my property. What stops her from, from uh, taking somebody's jewelry when she has a bad day if she stole from Walmart? I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, how, how now what I'm doing when I bring, when I'm hiring agents, I'm actually doing background checks on them now. I'm not using the licenses that because of this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, that, that's crazy, you know, but the other thing is, you really got to put a group together of just solid, good, hardworking, honest people. 
And when people see that, that that's when I'm dealing with people, it's black and white, transparent. Here it is. What do you want to do? I give them options. Right. And and that's what I teach my agents. Who are we? What do we do? Look, we own a brokerage. We own a school. We've been doing this 25 years. We're rated top 15 percent. Blah, 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 blah. Here's what here's what we do. Here's what we bring to the table. You got to be able to have something like that. Bring that to the table. You know, the days of dancing around on Instagram and pink shoes are over, dude. I mean, those people out there, I mean, they sold three, four, five deals in their lives. Look them up and are in there getting millions of views, talking this. And you know, they're repeating. They're throwing up the garbage that they heard from the other guy, you know, and, and that's all it is. And I've had enough of it. Yeah. I'm actually taking it on. Like, I'm, I'm actually going to start taking that stuff on and publicizing it. So I'm going to call them out. Like, I, I don't care. I got nothing to lose now. We're going to keep going, right? <laughs> we're going go to go beat him with a stick. Wall, man. <laughs> You're going to beat him with a stick. I'm telling you. All right, brother. I, 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 I love enough. you, man. I, I had enough. I no, Philip, I appreciate you, brother. We thank yeah, you for man. coming on. If you guys want to check out the video of yeah. Phil and I, we're talking about the Florida housing market. You can search for it yep. on Saks Realty. And uh, we thank you, brother. Yep. And if anybody wants Thanks, to check Phil. out Pier 21 Realty, all platforms. Um, I have a video on there, about a 15-minute video, talking about what we were just talking about. So if anyone mm -hmm. wants to take a look Sounds at it, you're point. more than welcome. Thanks, man. Thank Great you. Night. Good to see you guys. See you soon. Okay, right, good to see care. you. All right, Melissa, I know this is going over, but let's take a couple of you, start a couple of these questions. Let's just take a couple of them, see if we can answer some things. And, sure. Uh, you know, and and yeah, I mean, what a, you know, Phil's going to beat him with a stick. I love Phil, man. You know what? Um, look, I, I, what I appreciate is people that don't sugarcoat. I, I don't. I, they don't sugarcoat what's really happening and, you know, the courage to be able to stand up and, you know, tell what's happening in your marketplace. Uh, you know, he's probably very successful and will be because people are going to draw to that. They want people to help them navigate this storm that is going to shoot straight with them. And I think if mm -hmm. anything, if you're an agent listening and you're a great agent, you know, take, take the rose colored glasses off. And, you know, get back to what, you know, the basics of serving people again, if, if you're, if you've strayed away from that and get back to the grounded reality of things and, um, and, and try and really educate people on, you know, don't worry about the commission check today. You know, if you're, you have to, you obviously, I hope that you've made enough money over the last couple of years to get you through, you know, nurturing some people and bringing them around to, uh, you know, to the point that where they're ready to buy a house and that you're working with them and not pressuring them, um, you know, telling them things that if they don't do it now, they're going to lose their golden opportunity. They're never going to be able to afford a house again, you know, date the rate, you know, refinance it later. Stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop the madness. Start looking at these clients like they're, you know, they're people, not dollar signs and let's focus on helping them and you know seeing where they are and making sure that they're ready ready financially and that they understand the commitment that they're getting themselves into before they buy a home so and and i'm talking about first-time buyers if you all have bought houses before you know the drill do whatever you want uh but these first-time buyers in my opinion they're the most vulnerable and that they're, doesn't and have an emotional. age. You could be 50 years old and be a first time buyer. So, yeah, I just uh, had a conversation with a first time home buyer last night and today. And you can feel it when they're talking. They're stressed. They are not necessarily prepared because they don't know. So they need to be handheld a little bit. And, you know, you feel, you feel for them. You want them to be able to have that dream and have it come to reality for them. It's tough really hard. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, let's answer just, a couple questions. Sure. Yeah, there was right. a um, comment here. I just wanted to fill up as a breath of fresh air in a market that seems to be deprived of oxygen. You three are doing great. And I think that's, um, he's a straight shooter. Very similar to you, Thank Todd. You, Thank yep. You. Thank you very much. So and here's much. another uh, super chat. Let's forget the market rates and politics. How does it speak for the health of an economy when a massive part of a generation has to move back home with their parents or settle for roommates? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's different when your parents move in with you because, you know, we're seeing that too, Kav, you know, where a lot of the, yeah. the, uh, the aging population, they can't afford to be in the home. 
Uh, so they're moving in. I mean, geez, how hard is that? You know, you've, uh, you know, you've gotten to a point. I mean, they're fighting it. You know, people like their independence. I mean, these aren't people that are, you know, um, invalid or, you know, a lot of them, they just can't, they can't afford it. You know, maybe somebody passed, maybe they're on social security and Medicare, uh, their housing costs, you know, have gone up They're uh, in an area where their, their taxes have, you know, gone up over the years. And, you know, they have to cut a lawn, they have to plow snow, they have to, you know, pay all these extra things and fix the house up. And a lot of the kids are saying to them, look, let's just stop this, sell the house, let's get you in with us, we'll build a, you know, an in-law suite or a, a accessory dwelling unit, whatever, uh, just have you live with us in the house. Um, so it's both sides, what we're seeing it happen on both sides. A lot of the houses that we've sold recently have been to multi-generational um mm -hmm. families so you know they're moving people in uh and mm -hmm. look this is i'm not saying that that's a bad thing you know uh for some you know maybe uh, maybe we should get back to being slow to have you know people living by themselves um uh, it this right now it's more than it's ever been you know we go back to the 50s and 60s and there were, I think, uh, a lot more people living in the average home. Mm -hmm. We're going to have um, kind of going in a completely other direction. Is there any snowball chance that HOA will be outlawed? Everyone keeps saying that they do not want to live in an HOA, but 97% of real estate in Florida is HOA choices are Yeah, slim. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. I think these uh, communities that are established, HOAs will stay that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, Same is, with this is a great question. Is there a way to track how many of these two, three, four percent homeowners took out equity on their homes? That will tell a lot of the story. Yeah, I think you could do title uh, abstract, uh, you know, where you can see what's, you know, what's filed, liens are filed on a property. Uh, but as far as a uh, and there may be a service out there. I'm not familiar with it, but you know, you would think that they're filing liens when they're lending money. Uh, so there is a paper trail that goes with that, and uh, I'm sure you know you can research it. Mm -hmm. How about this question: What would happen if foreigners were not allowed to invest in real estate? Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen either. I mean, Canada came up with an investor ban for a period of years. I think they put it out in, geez, maybe it was 2021 now, uh, but it was ridiculous. I read into the, um, uh, you know, to what they were doing and how they were doing it, and it was a joke. So I think that there's there has been a lot of talk around this subject um, Canadians, by the way, are the number one uh, foreign investors in U.S. real estate. Uh, I think China is second. Um, but, I mean, you just heard, who was it? Was it Phil that just said, you know, somebody from Australia, was it? Austria, Australia, uh, paid $1.9 million for a condo. So I think, you know, I'd like to know, you know, where, how they're getting their money out of their country into, you know, buying this real estate. I don't, I, I don't want to know. I, I could care less actually, but it's a, it's a good question. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the things they're trying to do is ban these, uh, you know, institutional buyers from there's two bills on the table that I've seen that are, they're wanting to limit or, fine high highly tax one bill over 70 if a investor has over 75 houses the other bill wants to prevent institutional buyers um, in some capacity from owning single family houses give them 10 years to liquidate the inventory uh, the problem is going to be the pushback is going to come that that's not free market or cap you know a capital capitalistic uh, society um but i think what's going to happen if you look at banning i don't think that's practical but if you go on to hud home store 
HUD.gov. This is where all of the HUD homes that have been foreclosed on are pushed out for sale. And for the first 30 days, there are only owner occupants or um, nonprofits that are allowed to buy within the first 30 days. I think if we came up with something to where there was a time period, if you're not an owner occupant and you're, you, you're going to put a house on the market that a non-owner occupant can't bid on that house for 30 days. But on the flip side, it would never pass because the homeowners have profited the most off of the investors. And the investors in this race, this you know bubble that we built, these investors were the ones that were paying top dollar, paying cash, and letting the people live in the house for six months rent free. So the seller on the flip side would say, I don't want to restrict my house for 30 days. So that probably will never happen, right? You're going to tell a homeowner they can't sell their house to whoever they want to sell it to. So the problem is, I don't think we're looking at the problem in the right lens. I think the problem is we're not letting the free market be a free market. We're propping it up. And this is all stemming from back in the 80s when we started to become more of a global economy, not just, you know, focusing on the financial well-being of the U.S. We started distributing, you know, manufacturing and jobs and buying and importing and exporting and all these things, which seemed great at the time. But now we don't have any way of backing that off. A recession is destructive. So what they try and do is minimize the impact of any recession by offsetting it with inflation, hyperinflation and printing money. And that's another conversation in itself. But, you know, I think if the government would stay out of a lot of the markets, not prop them up, I think they would adjust themselves and we wouldn't be looking at homes that are eight and nine times seven, six, call it six times earnings to buy a home. It's it's never worked before in the history of home ownership. It's never worked before where it's a good thing that housing is that expensive. Seven, eight, nine times earnings to buy a home. So I think that's where we are. Anyway, let's take two more questions. Okay. And I know a lot of you guys say these things are too long and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you can come back to it and watch the rest of them. But I mean, as long as we have people that are showing up and, you know, it's kind of yeah. hard to turn you all off. No, especially when questions are still being asked. What percentage yeah. of American buyers have student loans? I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I mean, I'm sure a lot. I mean, there's still people in their 40s that have student loans. Um, I, older than that, that have student loans. This is another thing. And and, and then look, I'm not, I'm, guys, I know it sounds like I'm anti, you know, government or something. I'm not. I think that, you know, look, the, the government was created, you know, for a purpose. But I think what, what happened, and we have to have law and order, and we have to have regulations. I'm not saying we shouldn't have regulations. But what happens is when you look at the things that the government has been involved with, where they sometimes, in my opinion, have overstepped, it has not been to the betterment of the, our, our people. And student housing is another one of those you know, situations. When the government came in and started buying all of the student loans and you know, deferring the payments, all it did was allow the universities to raise their prices. And people said yes, because they were hopeful that they would come out with a better job and make more money to pay these expensive loans. So by deferring, giving loans where the universities had to give the loans, you know, and, and you know, people had to qualify for it and it suppressed tuitions to a degree. You get the government that comes in and says, oh, finance everybody. Everybody can go to school we're going to push these back. They won't be no, nothing to be due to you graduate. And then they get them in this situation where they sign up and man, they don't even graduate and they still owe all this money. 
you know, so I'm not, when I say I don't like student bailouts, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm to, to be hurtful to people that have student loans, but why are we doing this? We set it up, we bail it out because they're people benefiting by all of this, right? Businesses benefiting by all of this. Universities are benefiting by all this. So they can pay $6 million to a football coach every year. Who's worth that? Come on. You know, it, it's, we, we've gotten, I think that we've just gotten to, we've just gotten to a place where, you know, we've just destroyed this place, in my opinion. Just really, you know, anyway, one more. Okay. I've seen the multiple offers advertised on a listing, then a week later it went back on the market. What happened to the multiple offers? Multiple offers, I don't even entertain. Not worth it. And this is the same way, Rebecca. This is the same way of the buyers we're experiencing right now. They're saying no to multiple offers. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people are pushed to the new home market because they don't want to negotiate. They just want to go in, pick a floor plan, pick a house, pick a lot and buy it. So this is one of the reasons why, you know, the new home construction was so successful uh, over the last several years, because people didn't want to compete. They didn't want to bid. Um, that hasn't changed. It's not fun. So buyers, I'm experiencing it now personally with people that I'm helping. We'll look at a house. There'll be multiple offers on it if it's priced right. And they just say No. And they're not even interested to know whether it's priced right, by the way. It may be priced really low, and I'm going, guys, but this is really underpriced. They don't care. They don't want to hear it. They're not buying it. So, you know, we've gotten ourselves into a position where the buyers don't trust it. And what that means is that, you know, this is widespread. It doesn't just mean, I don't know where Rebecca is, but this is this is widespread. We heard, uh, you know, uh, our one uh, agent in Santa Fe say that it was happening there. We know that it's happening in Florida. We know that it's happening in Maryland. So this is widespread. So this kind of thing isn't going to go away tomorrow. You're still going to get your pockets where people are willing to overpay or, or outbid. And guess what? More power to you if that's you. Um, but um, I, I don't think, I think that's a repeat buyer that's doing that. That's a domestic uh, somebody who's migrating domestically from one state to the next because of a job, they're a second or third buyer, you know, they bought before they're, they'll do that kind of thing. But most, most of our first time buyers are not falling for it. You know, they, they, they're, they're wet. They've already been sidelined. They're ready to stick it out. They've moved back home. They've signed leases and uh, they're just ready to hold out. But anyway, Melissa. Mm -hmm. What a show. And um, you touched on our audience and just really how smart they are, super informative, loyal, and it's it's really quite awesome to do this every week with you guys. It is. And we love you guys. We appreciate you spending your Tuesday nights with us. We appreciate the ones that watch it later that can't be here on a Tuesday night. And uh, we'll, we'll keep it coming. We are, you know, we have the... the uh, the day after Christmas here, uh, we'll be live. Uh, we're bringing it to you. So uh, we're yeah. going to keep going as long as we have people that show up. We're going to keep you posted on what's happening in the housing market, what we think is going to happen. And we're here to help you. So reach out, book a call. Uh, if you need an agent, uh, check out our map. Uh, if we don't have somebody in that area yet, reach out to us. We'll be glad to, uh, to work with you individually to help you find somebody that uh yep. you know um uh that that we believe will be um a professional choice for you and uh that will give you the service that and the uh education that you're looking for so we appreciate it thank you melissa mm -hmm. and joe thank in the, you, Todd. In the uh, behind the scenes and joe absolutely Another week. yep yep and guys one of the best things that you can do i mean it is amazing i am so grateful our channel growth has just been so awesome um, thank you so much for that. It helps when you like videos, it helps the algorithm push it out. When you comment, it helps the algorithm push out our videos. It helps us get into, you know, um, you know, into the lives of people that are wondering what's going on in the housing market. So 
Keep that coming. Share us with your family and friends. And if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so now and uh, hit the alert bell and you'll know every time we upload content. So see you next time. See you next time.